the decayed. The thing about death that they don't tell you is the smell. When anything dies, it loses all control of bladder and bowel functions. What makes things worse is when the flesh of the deceased has been rotting for some time. The decayed is a type of smell that you'll never forget. I remember one time when I was eight, I was with my uncle deer hunting, closing in on the twilight hours, and it was getting dark fast. It was the last day of the season, so I had to capitalize on the opportunity, or I'd have to wait until next season. Having sat in the stand all day, you can only imagine my surprise when a moderately sized buck ran out from the brush and poked its head out into a small clearing. I drew my bow back and held the arrow waiting for the deer to come out more, but it just stood outside my field of view. I loosed my arrow and sent it flying into the brush, hoping to make any contact. The shot wasn't clean since it hit a few branches and some brush, but surely the arrow had indeed hit its target, as the deer acted accordingly. My uncle, despite being the expert tracker, was struggling to find any signs of the said deer when we went to look for it. The deer must have gone through some of the brush at a high speed, making the tracks more difficult the closer it came to night. We had an idea of where the deer had headed, but we weren't sure if the deer had even died yet. Around 7, when the sun had completely set, we had to call off the search since we lost all the tracks in the dark. The next day, we headed out into the woods, when the sun was clear overhead. We went to the last place where we had seen the tracks, and sure enough, up in the sky were crows circling not far off overhead. That was a sure sign that something had died nearby. It took us about five minutes to find from there the remains of the deer. We smelt it before we saw it. The stench was unlike any spoiled meat I'd ever smelled. It was an invisible cloud of rancid death. By the time we got to the deer, there had been plenty of scavenging animals and various types of bugs already eating my prized animal. This deer was surely mine as it still had my arrow lodged in its side. Fast forward seven years. My father ran away during that time and my mother couldn't really cope with his absence, so she turned to drugs as an escape. This led me to eventually stay with my grandmother, who lived in the next county over, but still allowed me to stay in the same school based on a technicality and the school district lines. I was able to still be with my friends, and that's all I had to go off of for quite some time. My living situation wasn't exactly ideal. The grandmother that I was staying with had been declining with Alzheimer's for quite some time now. Even before my parents split, she was already forgetting my name and calling me by my father's name by mistake. My grandfather had died a while back, way before that I could remember. I was told, however, that I would have liked him if he was still around. My grandmother got to the point to where she would spout nonsense, almost about everything, and never slept throughout the night without screaming. Due to her condition, my grandmother had a full-time caretaker, who didn't speak any English, that came and lived with us and aided my grandmother. I would obviously help out whenever I could, but I was still a child. During this odd time of my life, there had been a string of murders in the adjacent towns nearby, but none in ours. Much like what you see on TV, I just took this as the media trying to fearmonger you into more views for their news station, so I didn't pay it much mind. However, the school district didn't see it that way, and was very strict on security. Most of my school's extracurricular activities had been canceled, which was unfortunate. However, in the meantime, I picked up Airsoft, which I was really getting into with a couple of friends. We would practice and hang out in the woods until it got fairly dark. I suppose playing Airsoft in some way allowed me to escape the harsh reality that was currently my family state. I caught on the news that evening that a body was found dismembered in a field on the other side of the town. The head was missing and the body was skinned. That made for eight murders in the span of three months. The killings were getting closer. Later that night, I got a text from my dad stating that he wanted to meet up for lunch the next day. I hadn't talked to my dad in three years, so this caught me by surprise. I debated on ignoring him 
but I ended up responding and agreeing to have him pick me up. I guess there was some news he wanted to tell me in person. That night I hardly slept. I was anxious about the next day. I figured that he was going to ask me to move back in with them since my grandmother was no longer able to care for herself, let alone me. I fell asleep, but shortly after I was soon awakened by my grandmother screaming, as she normally did. Thankfully, the caretaker, who was always on the ball, seemed to be able to caress her back into sleep. Even though I knew the current state of my grandmother, her screams in the middle of the night always seemed to terrify me, at least at first. However, I found myself back asleep, and I woke up the next day to my alarm clock. I got ready and waited for my dad to pick me up. He was early. The car he was in was a newer model, one I'd never seen him in before. I saw him pull up, but I made him walk up to the door and knock on it. I embraced him half-heartedly, and we walked over to his car. We drove over to a restaurant across town without saying a word to each other, and grabbed a booth in the back corner. My dad was never good with words, especially small talk. I knew he had something important to tell me, but... I wasn't sure what it was. Did he want me to move back in with him? Was he moving somewhere? Did he find someone else to live with? We finally ordered our meals and he smiled at me with eyes full of reluctance. He was clearly troubled by something but was trying his best to put on a brave face. I just wanted to rip this band-aid off and asked him what he wanted to tell me. He began to cry when he reached out for my hand but I pulled away. What, what is it? I asked in a demanding tone. It's your mother. She was one of the victims of the recent murders last week. I just found out yesterday. This news hit me like several waves of emotion. At first I was confused. Then I was sad. Finally, I was angry. I didn't wait for my food to come to the table. I just got up and left right then and there. My father stayed behind and just sobbed at the table, like a child. I expected him to come after me and bring me back, but he never did. I made my way out of the restaurant and down the street. I was so upset I didn't realize where I was until it started to rain, but it didn't matter. I just needed to walk. A part of me wanted to go back to that table and ask about her death but I was filled with hatred towards the person who had killed my mother. But also, for some strange way, I also blamed my father. He and my mother should still be together. He should have protected her. After about an hour of walking, I realized I was on the other side of the town. I had no money for a taxi, and I couldn't call my grandmother. I sure as heck wasn't going to call my father. I could use the walk anyways, I thought. I kept off to the sides of the road and on the border of the tree line, not thinking about anything as the swirling cocktail of emotions overflowed in my head. I finally made it to the part of the town that I could recognize. There was the old abandoned lumber mill that I would sometimes play airsoft at with my friends. We would only play outside in the lumber yard, never inside. The lumber mill had heavy chains and a lock on the exterior doors, preventing anyone from getting in probably to keep squatters out and from people hurting themselves on the bandsaw. I decided to walk through the lumber yard in order to take a shortcut and quickly get back home. The shortcut alongside my curiosity would soon become a mistake. As I was crossing the yard, a startling noise got my attention. Coming from inside the lumber mill seemed to be screaming. I figured this to be unlikely considering that all the doors and windows were not only securely fastened, but locked from the outside. I looked at the lumber mill, and sure enough, after a quick inspection of the exterior, one of the boards that covered the windows had fallen off, leaving about a four-foot hole to enter through. My body was reacting in a way that most prey do when they sense danger nearby. I had tingles going down the back of my neck, and a chill going down my spine goosebumps on my arms. However, my mind, being preoccupied with the recent bad news, told me, just take a quick peek inside. 
I quickly walked over to the window and peered inside. Due to the angle of the window and the poor lighting, I saw next to nothing. However, the screaming got more intense. A part of me wanted to see what was going on and try to help while the rest of my body was telling me to get out of there. The next thing I knew, I was crawling inside the lumber mill. The smell of old wood and sawdust filled my nostrils. The screaming persisted, as if someone were to be tortured. However, the sound seemed to be coming from below, as if it was in some type of basement. I looked around briefly for some stairs, but I couldn't really find any. After a quick search and following the sounds of the screams, I soon found a hole in the floor. The hole in the floor was no bigger than 18 inches. Although I was young and quite small, this was still something I wouldn't be able to fit into. The wooden floor that I walked on creaked as I walked over to the hole. I took my smartphone out of my pocket and turned on the flashlight feature and peered inside. Inside the hole seemed to be some kind of basement area. The area was filled with old tools and some scraps and pieces of metal that I didn't really know what they were. In the corner of the basement I saw movement coming from a figure. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at since I've never seen anything like this before. The figure was tall and quite skinny. It didn't appear that they were wearing any clothing. The angle and the perspective at which I was at did not do me any favors. However, what I was looking at, I knew wasn't normal. It was what I saw next that made my blood run cold. As the screaming continued, I realized that the screams were not coming from this figure, but from another one. Laying on the ground, under one of the knees of the tall, gaunt figure, was a man. The man was curled up in the fetal position, not trying to move. At first, I thought the tall creature was pulling clothes off the man, but after a few seconds of watching, I soon realized it wasn't pulling off clothes. It was pulling off chunks of skin. This was single-handedly the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen in my life. At this time, my mind and body finally agreed that it was now time to get out of there. Unfortunate to say, my escape was less than stealthy. I had just seen the most terrifying thing I have ever seen in my life, so the first thing I did was sprint out of there. My adrenaline seemed to have carried me out of there quite quickly. I ran out of the building, through the lumber yard, and a good portion down the street. By the time I got home, it was nighttime. My grandmother didn't say anything when I walked in. The caretaker just waved as she was still feeding my grandmother some soup. A part of me wished that she'd ask me where I'd been all day, so I would have an excuse to tell her what I'd seen, but obviously that didn't happen. The caretaker didn't speak English, so even if I did tell her what I'd seen, she would have not have understood me. I just walked past and into my room. So much had happened today, I wasn't sure how to cope with it. Being told about the death of my mother, some creature skinning some poor person alive, it was all too much for my young brain. That evening is when the dreams started. They were horrifying. I didn't want to relive that event seeing that poor person being killed in the most horrifying way possible, but it appeared that my mind had other plans. In my dream, I was back in that lumber mill. I was peering in that hole, seeing that creature and that poor person. However, off to the right, I saw a door being opened, slowly. There was no one or no thing opening the door. It just opened on its own. I shined my flashlight over to see a set of stairs heading downwards. Like in most dreams, dream logic prevailed. I didn't want to go down the set of stairs. However, I was being guided by some unseen force. I slowly descended the set of stairs, each step sending my anxiety and my stress up to a higher level. I finally made it to the bottom of the stairs. Fear had a new grip on me which I'd never felt before. I felt like my life was going to soon come to an end. A brief shine of my flashlight in the basement revealed the horrifying image before me. Much like what I was seeing from above, I saw the creature skinning the man alive, except now this time, I was a part of it. Shining my flashlight revealed my position, causing the creature to stop what it was doing. 
In a flash of horrifying speed, the creature quickly pounced on me. The creature pinned me down effortlessly, while taking a long and withered hand across my torso, while grabbing onto my skin and tearing it from my body. The pain, despite still being in a dream, was unbearable. It felt like flaming screws were being dragged across my body. Before I awoke, something interesting happened. The creature took a handful of my skin and placed it onto its own dried and withered body. When it did this, a part of its body changed into mine, and it smiled. I then awoke from this dream, and I was back in my bed. I let out a sigh of relief, seeing that I was back in my own room. However, it would appear that the nightmare was not quite over. I tried to move to get up to go to the bathroom, but I was paralyzed. Panic and anxiety soon quickly ensued. To make matters worse, I could see out of the corner of my eye a tall, shadowy figure standing in my bedroom. The figure got closer to me. It practically stood right over my bed. Thankfully, it didn't take long for me to fall back asleep. Although I didn't notice this at the time, but the shadow figure from my sleep paralysis and the creature in my dream had similar characteristics. It was as if it followed me from that horrific dream. I awoke the next day, and it took me some time before I remembered what had happened the night before. Thankfully, I planned on playing airsoft with my friends. This is something normally I could manage to do all day. My friend group was small, but we had a close bond despite having such different lives. Later that day, we met in the forest, and us four played for hours. We only stopped twice. Once to go get some food at a friend's house whose mother was kind enough to provide a luxurious spread of pizza and soda. The other time we stopped so we could take a bathroom break. We found an area so secluded in the woods that we didn't have to worry about being quiet or for someone to accidentally catch a glimpse of us using the restroom, which is bound to happen when you have unsupervised group of boys out in the woods for so long. The times I spent out in the woods shooting and being shot at by my friends with airsoft guns made me forget about the world. I was mentally in a place that life was almost enjoyable, at least for the time being. This would change when I would go home. It was now dark out. I had successfully spent my Saturday almost completely outside in the woods. The location we played in would cause me to take a path that would lead to the back of my house that faced another set of woods. I was tired and sweaty, so seeing the back door being left open caused no initial reason for alarm. It was probably my grandmother's caretaker having a smoke break and leaving the door open to hear if my grandmother needed anything. What did surprise me was that the house had hardly any lights on. I walked into the kitchen and turned on the lights. I could hear shuffling in the other room and assumed it was my grandmother. I peeked my head in the other room and was shocked to see my grandmother standing and facing the corner. She stood slouched and slightly trembling. I immediately ran over and grabbed her wheelchair and sat her down safely. Where's Lucinda? I asked, knowing full well she wasn't going to respond correctly. She looked at me with a glance of fright, but she often looked as if she didn't know what was going on. I made sure to stay with Grandma until Lucinda returned, but she never did. After waiting for two hours, I took it upon myself to get Grandma ready for the evening and tuck her in. I forgot how difficult it was to get her ready since she was so non-compliant. After getting her into bed, I took a quick shower and did the same. I laid in bed waiting for sleep to fill my eyes, letting my mind wander the dark plains that dreams are found on when I heard a sound. Initially, the sound scared me. Underneath my bed came the sound of something banging and scratching. At first, I thought perhaps it was one of my cats, but I was too afraid to look. My curiosity outweighed my fear, and I glanced under my bed to see nothing there. The banging continued only for a few more minutes. Perhaps the house was settling, or some kind of animal crawled under the floorboards and got stuck. Sleep eventually found me, but I wish it hadn't. My dreams were filled with terror and pain. 
I could see the anguish of people being dragged into the woods where dreadful things would happen. The dream was from the perspective that I was hurting these people, but I was not in human form. I took the shape of some evil beast with long arms and painfully sharp fingers, much like the one I saw the night before. My dream was in first person, but I could only tell from the look on the people's face that I must have been this terrifying beast. Again, I woke up in a cold sweat. Thankfully, I was not paralyzed this time. It was still nighttime, and I was still tired. It took me a second to realize what caused me to wake, as I rubbed my eyes and got out of bed. I could hear someone in my house screaming. They were the screams of my grandmother. Normally, my grandmother had her nurse to help her fall back asleep, but seeing how that she was now gone, I figured that I had to help her. I opened my door, and the screaming immediately stopped. It was as if making sounds alerted her, and she became quiet. I waited in the doorway, seeing if the screams would continue. I wanted to check up on her regardless, just to make sure. I walked down the hall, and as I passed the kitchen, I could see the back door to the house was open. I paused, as a chill slowly crept down my spine, as the thought of someone else being inside the house slowly festered, like an old wound. The door being open didn't initially indicate to me anything other than a potential intruder. That is, until I went over to close the door, and I glanced outside. Outside, just beyond the veil of light that was emitted from the kitchen, was a figure. I instantly recognized it as my grandmother. She was still in the field of view, but was facing the woods. She was shaking like she normally did, but her gown was wet. She must have been freezing. I ran outside to grab her when I heard something that made me stop in my tracks. Inside, I could hear the familiar scream of my grandmother the one I thought who was in front of me. I was about 20 yards away from whoever this person was that was imitating my grandmother. I slowly backpedaled while not taking my eyes off this person in fear that they would attack me. I tripped going into the kitchen and ran quickly inside, locking the door behind me. I went to check my grandmother, who I found was on the floor. She was sobbing, but I was able to get her back up and onto the bed. For my sanity's sake, I decided to share the bed with my grandmother that night, in her room. I made sure to lock the door, but also moved a small piece of furniture in front of the door, as a safety precaution. I didn't sleep much that night, mainly from my grandmother tossing and turning, but I would be lying to say that my encounter with whatever it was outside didn't shake me up. The next morning, I did my best to get my grandmother ready. This took some time since I had to dress her and feed her on my own. I called the nursing company and told them about the situation, how the nurse just got up and left my grandmother without warning. They were also surprised since she didn't mention anything to them either. The morning and the rest of the afternoon I waited for the replacement nurse to come and help my grandmother. There were a few things I wanted to do that day, but those things would have to wait until I knew my grandmother was safe. Around 3, the replacement nurse finally showed up, and I texted all my friends to quickly get a game of airsoft going before the night came. In between matches, I shared with them what had happened the night before. Seeing what had happened out loud made me realize that it was really late last night. It was pretty poor visibility, and I was probably still very tired. That back door always had an issue being locked. It was quite possible that it just didn't close all the way. After mulling it over with my friends, I felt much better. I think with everything going around lately, it just put me in a weird mindset and on high alert. We made sure to end before dark, since none of us wanted to be outside in the dark woods with a potential serial killer on the loose. I walked back to my house and entered my backyard. I glanced over to the part of the base of the house and saw a door to the crawl space it was slightly ajar. I then remembered what had happened the night before, about the pounding and scratching. Something was probably under there. Having my airsoft gun, I felt a false sense of security. I'm sure I could clear out the crawl space with a few well-placed shots of whatever critter was down there. I turned the flashlight on my gun and opened the crawl space door. 
A quick peek inside revealed something in the back corner that happened to be under my room. I shot a few shots at the mass, which caused it to move slightly, but still sat in the same position. It was so far back in there that I couldn't make out what it was that was under there. I got on my hands and knees and went inside and crawled under the house. The smell of death instantly struck me, and I found it hard to breathe. I could hear an odd sound now coming from the red mass as it began to bang on the floor above, causing the same noise that I'd heard the night before. The movements looked human, but my eyes refused to believe that this weird pile in my back corner had any life to it. I continued crawling, but made sure to keep my gun pointed at it. The smell alone was nauseating, causing me to lose the ability to think about anything other than that smell. When I finally crawled within distance, I realized why it took me so long to identify what was making that sound. What was under my floor was the nurse who had gone missing. She was still alive, but barely. To my horror, the state in which she was left in caused me to scream. All of her skin had been removed, which left a writhing vessel of flesh that was barely clinging to life. She couldn't say anything. She just moaned. I tried to flee from the terrible scene and turned around by crawling. The nurse who was now behind me was crying, while another sound could be heard over by the door of the crawl space. It was a shuffling sound, but the speed at which it moved was very quick. I could see it looked like an elongated person crawling, much like a spider. Flesh could be seen falling off of its body as it moved over to the door of the crawl space. Of all the terrible things this creature could have done, it performed a simple task in which I knew I was going to die. My airsoft pellets were not going to save me from the horrors that this creature was going to do to me. Instead of crawling out of the crawl space, the creature quickly but simply closed the crawl space door, trapping me inside with it. The Horrors of Romance Written by Paige Turner It's hard to be a romance novelist when your life is so full of horror, but hey, sometimes you gotta follow the contracts. My real mistake was going full brooding author after the divorce. I moved clear across the country to ensure I never accidentally ran into Marcy, or any of our old friends, again, and I bought a cozy house in the middle of nowhere. It's on the outskirts of a national forest, and the closest town is almost an hour away. There are a few hunting clubs nearby, but they're all abandoned this time of year. The soil is supposed to be useless for farming, so I got a great deal on five acres. I don't really have plans for it. I just want to ensure hunters keep a fair distance away. There's not much of a clearing around my home, but I'm having some smaller trees removed soon. I need a wider field of vision plus some shotguns, security cameras, and an electric fence. Maybe some landmines. But, bitter paranoia aside, it's a beautiful spot. I thought it would help me recover from the irony of writing love stories, while it felt like my heart was being pushed through a shredder. But, if anything, it only made things worse. Which is why I'm writing this, instead of deciding how Cassidy will first meet Christopher. Just once, I'd like to decide how Christopher murders Cassidy. Sorry, that was a little bit dark. I don't fantasize about killing Marcy. I mean, it's hard to write about something you don't believe in. Not that I believe in murder, I just don't believe in love. Look, I'm only trying to express some of these emotions before I drown, okay? Does anyone have a problem with that? It's bad enough I'm losing my mind out here. The last thing I need is for the police to show up asking if I've ever thought about harming myself or others. The answer is no, at least not outside of the literal sense. I'm a writer. Give me a break. This is how we process. Well, that and rebellious imaginations. Or maybe I've finally cracked and they've just been full-blown hallucinations. There's no history of mental illness in my family, but I've been under an extraordinary amount of stress. I wouldn't be surprised to wake up in a straitjacket with some stuffy doctor asking, what was the last thing you remember? I wasn't a poster boy for sanity before coming here, but 
I never questioned the fabric of reality until my first night in this house. A friend recommended writing down everything that happened from start to finish, in as much detail as possible. It's supposed to help me organize my thoughts in a way that makes them easier to understand. My hopes aren't exactly high, but screw it. I'm a writer, so why the heck not? It doesn't really matter how much time I spend on this anyway. There's that one thing about romance novels that nobody gives a crap how Cassidy and Christopher meet. They only care about what happens after the clothes come off. I once changed how the main character spelled his name halfway through the book, and not one person noticed. Not even my editor. I guess I'm not exactly thrilled at the prospect of reliving the last several weeks, but I'm desperate enough to try anything. I sent the moving trucks out two days ahead of myself, and the furniture was already in place when I arrived. The boxes were the only thing left for me to deal with, and I settled for unpacking the necessities as they were needed. The spare bedroom is still full of junk I'll probably never need. It was around 9 on Saturday morning when I first arrived. The movers were already long gone and I was completely alone. I converted the dining room space into an office. It has a great view of the creek and when I sat to write for the first time, words poured from me like they used to before I became a rotting husk of cynicism. Did that have more to do with writing a breakup scene than the peaceful scenery? Maybe. But it's a moot point now. Any sense of serenity quickly evaporated with a strange high pitch, uh, how do I even describe it? I've heard it at least half a dozen times since, but it never gets easier to define. It's not a scream or a cry. It's not like the weird predator clicking noise either. It's more like the screech of nails on a chalkboard, only more, I don't know, primal? If you can imagine a primal chalkboard. Look. I said I don't know. I really don't. That's the point. What matters is that I spent the entire day absorbed in a fantasy world, only to come out of it hearing some ungodly, indescribable sound that made my blood run cold and sweat drip down my spine. I looked up to see it was suddenly dark out. I had no idea what had happened and that the patio bulbs were dead. Replacing them was absolutely out of the question. Nothing would have convinced me to open the door. I hadn't bothered buying curtains yet, and the only thing I could see through any window was my own reflection. That was the most unnerving part of it all. That sound was so loud, whatever was making it had to be close by. My heart skipped a few beats as I imagined what might be out there, looking in at me, plain as day. Eventually, I forced myself into motion and began turning off the lights. I wanted to minimize the view inside, but I didn't expect to see anything myself. Yet for a fraction of a second, my reflection disappeared, and I saw two glowing red eyes set into a hulking humanoid shape, not 20 yards away. It was dark out, but the stars provided some slight illumination, enough to distinguish that pitch black figure from the background. It was only the briefest glimpse. It disappeared into the tree line and I was left staring through my transparent reflection, wondering just how real that moment had been. It's amazing how one begins to question their own sanity when logic is threatened. Had those red orbs really been eyes? Was it really the shape of something on two legs? I keep thinking about the Wizard of Oz. There's an urban legend that one of the munchkins actually hung themselves on set, and the footage made it past post-production edit. The supposedly fatal moment occurs when the Tin Man joins Dorothy and the Scarecrow. If you focus on the background as the three characters skip away, you'll see a large shadow seemingly rise and drop. Now, the idea of a hanging munchkin has been implanted in your mind. That may be what it looks like, but if you were informed that the studio had several large birds running around that day, it suddenly looks very much like a crane spreading and folding its wings. I'm aware those two things don't sound like they would be similar, but the clips are all over YouTube if you want to see for yourself. Basically, that's just a roundabout way of saying I wasn't sure if I really saw what I thought I saw, you know? I was already one stubbed toe away from a full mental breakdown, and now I had to wonder if I was hallucinating. Well, spoiler alert, I wasn't.
That night, I hung blankets over every window before turning the lights back on and going to bed. I only had screws to get the job done, but you can't argue with the results. Marcy kept the cats, but even their combined efforts wouldn't be any match for my redneck curtains. In some regard, I'm adapting to country life just fine. I spent the next day buying and installing motion-detecting floodlights. I was pleased with myself for presumably outsmarting my new nemesis, but I failed to anticipate the numerous false alarms wildlife would cause. I was getting up to investigate every five minutes, usually just in time to see a raccoon disappear into the forest, but my determination had doubled since the night before. I wanted pictures that would prove I didn't get all worked up over a black bear. I might not know much, but I know black bears don't have red eyes. Sadly, that whole night was a bust, unless you count experiencing my first case of sleep paralysis. It's been happening at least two to three times a week ever since. And I gotta say, I'm not a fan. It was midnight when I went to bed, and since my clocks project time onto the ceilings, I knew it was 3.30 when something woke me. I was lying on my back, trying to remember what I heard, when the strange screeching noise from the night before made my insights recoil with pure dread. It sounded like it was coming right outside my window. I tried to sit up and simply couldn't. You know, the pins and needles sensation of a sleeping arm or foot. That's how my entire body felt. My sight was restricted to solely what I could see without moving my head, but by focusing my vision to the far left, I was just able to make out the window, an old white sheet still acting as a curtain. But it was thin, and the floodlights were clearly visible behind it. Had it not been for the sound and the tall, hulking shadow outlined in the sheet center, I would have blamed another animal for setting off the motion detectors. The pricks of pins and needles increased tenfold as I struggled to move, but it was useless. As useless as trying to maintain my focus on the window. My eyes burned with strain, but, but I couldn't look away either. Somehow my thoughts turned to Marcy, and how she was likely asleep in that mechanic's arms. A mechanic's, for goodness sake. She won't even pump her own gas because of the smell. Sorry, not important, but that's what I thought about while staring at this mysterious shape. Eventually, I must have fallen asleep because it was suddenly daylight, and I could move again. I leapt out of bed in a hurry to check around outside, and though I didn't find any footprints, I did find something much more horrifying. My bedroom window was somehow cracked open, but I'm positive that they were all locked when I went to sleep. The wood was chipped at the bottom, like someone crammed their nails into a tiny crack and managed to force it open despite the lock. I really didn't know what to make of it. When I re-engaged the lock, it seemed to work fine. Unfortunately, I never thrived under pressure, so I didn't think to screw the window shut until the next incident, but I'll get to that shortly. Things were actually normal for the remainder of the week, unless you count a few unusually vivid nightmares. I mean the regular kind this time. It's debatable if one would label the act of brutally murdering their ex as a nightmare, I digress. Don't fall in love, kids. It's not worth it. Not in an era where you can buy electronic romance instead. The next couple of weeks made the first week look like a vacation. There's always two to three quiet days between incidences, and this thing somehow manages to pick up the exact moment I drop my guard to suddenly start screeching. If I'm lucky, the strange sounds are where it stops, but on the bad nights, it's only the beginning. After a particularly hard day, I decided to open the housewarming gift from my editor. I don't know much about liquor, but the bottle looked very expensive. I never quite mastered the art of self-control, so I normally avoid alcohol, especially when alone. But at a certain point, you'll do anything to numb the pain. With the amount I've consumed, most people would have been on the verge of drunk, but I was drunk. So drunk, in fact, that I suddenly heard the screeching noise. I rushed to turn on the outside lights. It was like the sun returned for a late night encore. That's when I finally got my first full look at this thing. I could say it resembled the Grim Reaper, but that would be misleading. 
When you think of the Grim Reaper, you probably imagine a skeleton in a black hooded robe. And this was, well, this was different. The creature was shrouded in something black. It was like a half-liquid, half-solid, sludgy substance. Dozens of inky tendrils rose from all over the creature's body, like Medusa snakes. They moved as if they were a part of the entity, rather than any type of clothing, even seeming to form its very hands rather than simply covering them. I couldn't tell its fingers apart from the tendrils, or maybe it just had 20 fingers. Well, who knows? And those eyes. God, was I right about those eyes. Two. Large, bulbous, red orbs were set in half-decomposed skull of a corpse. What little skin that remained was gray and mottled with a few white splotches of exposed bone. There had been moments where I've caught a whiff of its stench, and there was simply no words to convey the true horror of that smell. This isn't something I say lightly. I've worked some of the foulest jobs known to man, and I know the rotting stench of death. This was far more vile than such a simple explanation. We probably stared at one another for less than 10 seconds before I remembered to take a picture, but I was shaking uncontrollably and immediately dropped the phone. You're probably all familiar with the sickening sound of your phone colliding with a hard floor. It was just enough to pull my eyes away from the creature. I only glanced down for a fraction of a second, yet when I turned back, Nothing was there. I was almost drunk enough to go outside. There's no such thing as monsters, or cryptids, or whatever kids want to call the boogeyman these days. As far as I knew, that thing was either some nut job in a costume, or my mind had snapped in a forbiddenly real way. I tend to lean towards the latter myself, and confronting my hallucination seemed like the best thing I could do. If I proved to myself it wasn't real, I could learn to ignore it and get on with my life. I mean, sure, it probably wasn't the healthiest plan, but again, I was drunk and thinking of my deadline. Royce wants chapters 1 through 15 before April. That doesn't leave much time when you still have 14 left to write. Maybe I can combine an element from real life and make Christopher a vampire hunter. Those are still hot, right? Cassidy can be a hot 500-year-old vampire tragically turned at the age of 21, and all she wants is someone who will appreciate her for who she is on the inside, even if that person has devoted his life to killing her kind. That's the great thing about smut. It truly doesn't matter how your characters end up naked, so long as they stay that way for a few pages. Anyway, if it wasn't obvious of the unnecessary tangent, this is when the next sleep paralysis incident happened. I went to bed just after 11, and the clock said 3.17 when I woke, drenched in sweat. Cold beads of moisture ran from my temple to the back of my neck in maddening succession. But I couldn't wipe them away. I couldn't move at all. I was so mortified at the realization of what was happening that it took several seconds before I noticed the screech that I'll spend the rest of my life trying to describe to therapists. It sounds different somehow, and at first, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But then I strained my eyes to the left once again, and my heart froze mid-beat at the sight of my worst nightmare. Not only were the floodlights on, my makeshift curtain was flapping on the breeze of an open window. And this time, I could see the dark shadowy figure's red eyes, because they were on my side of the curtain. The motion detector timed out at the same instant, and the room was left in total darkness, except for those two glowing red orbs. I'm not exaggerating when I say my heart came to a full stop. I thought a heart attack would kill me before that thing could. I thought a lot of things in those few seconds, actually. To an extent, most people are probably familiar with the sensation of processing several possible scenarios in a single instant, but when you truly believe your life is in danger, that effect is magnified tenfold. In those few seconds, I saw my entire life play like a movie in my head. At the same moment, I saw myself trying to get up and run away. 
At the same moment, I saw myself trying to scream, trying to flail my limbs in a desperate attempt to repel a monster that may or may not be nothing more than the early warning signs of a full mental breakdown. It was too much of a strain to keep my eyes on it. I couldn't help looking away. It was only for the briefest instant, yet when I looked back, the creature was closer. It was just a little easier for my eyes to reach those haunting red orbs, and their angle to the window was just slightly different. But what could I do about it? Nothing. So I kept staring at its eyes, terrified if it would come closer if I looked away again. I have no idea when I fell asleep. It could have been an hour later. It could have been ten minutes. But it felt like an eternity. All I know is for sure that when I woke up, it was 7.30 and my window was wide open. I like to think I did what any sensible man would have done. I screwed every window shut while crying softly and questioning my sanity. I couldn't stand being alone anymore. I called my best friend, and during the keep in touch lecture and spilled my sorry guts. Landon had always been a practical guy. I'm sure he didn't believe me in the beginning, but he listened to my crap recordings like a good sport that he is. The recordings may have been worthless, but he came up with the idea to call him the next time I heard the screeching, and he only had to wait two nights before it happened again. Though it was initially difficult to make out, the sounds became more distinguishable once I cracked the patio door. He couldn't explain it either, which was fine. I didn't expect him to, but I was just relieved someone else could physically hear it. The noise is real, and well, if that's real, I guess the same is true for the thing making it. I've had sleep paralysis several times since the window incident but as far as I can tell, nothing had been back inside. I've only seen it one other time, and that was earlier this evening. I was smoking on the patio just before sunset, when I looked up to see two glowing red eyes staring back at me from inside the tree line. It seemed like it was waiting for the last light to fade, and I had the strangest urge to go to it. If the cherry of my cigarette hadn't fallen on my bare foot... I may not have realized I was actually moving closer. This entire ordeal has shaken me to my core. I'm not cut out for things like this. I have no idea what to do now or how to cope. Do I never go outside again? Do I build a fence? Do I get a dog? A gun? What should I do? Goodness, I can't believe I've turned into one of those people who seek comfort from random strangers on the internet. No offense if you are one of those people. I just have major trust issues, in case you couldn't tell. You know what? Never mind. I'll think I'll get that dog, after all. My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it. For a few reasons. I think it's the first story he'd ever told me, as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talking about ghosts and aliens, and you think to yourself, that isn't real. They're making it up, or they've been mistaken, or they're crazy. Something like that. You just can't believe it. Until something happens. Something that brings it all together. Connects the dots in a way that you didn't think before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story, again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet that I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it, or that thing, he called it Skinwalker. After an old Navajo tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story, the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night. 
he'd tell me. Coyotes. We'd kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind, and it could feed our whole family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and headed home, walking, because we didn't have a car or some type of four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods, and that's when we came up on it. Blood. Everywhere. Splattered on trees, and the grass, and the creek. Everywhere. At first, we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off one of the ones that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can't get out of, and they'll run it right into the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see the alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick. It's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den. Wolves neither, because they got too much of a fight. There were three, I think. Three bodies, just torn apart. You'd seen a head here or a leg over there, a torso here. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses and thought it was something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him. And I dang sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone, with nothing but a 22 and a pocket knife. He was only 13 at the time, so a 22 was about the only gun he could reliably use. Dad had a shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but we finally began tracking whatever did this. It wasn't hard, either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or... It dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I've never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world and ain't never heard noises like I'd heard that night. I heard things screaming. Heard deer and fox, rabbits and raccoons and birds. Just scared. Keep in mind this was maybe 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Except the fox and some birds, nothing was supposed to be awake. But they weren't just awake. They were moving. I saw a flock of birds that night fly straight into a tree, just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes. Nearly shot a couple, thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw that they were running towards us. They ran right past us. Didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple of wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing that they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together, that maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see. It wasn't something that we could kill. I don't know why we just didn't go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go towards trouble, to find. And knowing what I knew about my father during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally got into an open valley. It was a normal soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then. A lot of animals fleeing the forest had paid over the land. But where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step. Like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds, but that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing 40 pounds wet nearly tore up my throat once. That all means that it's quick and hard to hit. So we were following the tracks, and it didn't take us long to find where this thing was. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on top of this hill. 
Half of it been ripped up by a tornado, but nobody lived there. Not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high, but we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise, a screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up between two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech, while the other was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging a water bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down and whispers, I gotta stay behind him, cause we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, probably rabbit. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it and then keep shooting it until it doesn't move anymore then slit its throat. If it gets to dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day, I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tearing off its flesh and throwing what it didn't nibble on aside. There's blood all over the brick glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white human looking but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that, and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear, all the noises just ceased. I've never heard true silence before that, and never after, but for two seconds. Nothing. Nothing made a noise, which made it all the louder when it turned around. Made this shrill cry and jumped on my dad. He got a shot off, but I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind, but it was on him, tearing parts of him off. I started shooting at it with the 22 point blank, but it barely bled. I got out five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the gun's butt, but it wasn't budging. It didn't even register them. I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, and then it moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose and his eyes. It scalped him. Then, it started digging in and ripped off the bottom half of his jaw, the little bones in the tube in your neck, then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but... Somehow, my dad's knife ended up in the thing's shoulder, and my dad ended up on my back. I'm running, and goodness, I'm running faster than I've ever run before. The thing is following me. I end up in the woods, opposite the ones I've been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house, because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. That's cracking so loud and often, but I just don't look back. Finally, I trip on the gravel. I look up and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies, drinking around the campfire. I scream and cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, and he looks at me, and I'll never forget what he said. What is that thing on your back? he asked. Just as he said it, he saw. One of those awful flannel shirts that my dad would wear everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly we hear it, screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground and I'm fighting him, crying because I think we can still save him, somehow. But my dad had been gone for a while, even before I had picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I'd come with him. He and his buddies were all inside, locking the doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me what had happened. What happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it together to understand that there was something dangerous out there. All the lights in the house are on and someone calls the cops. They'll be there in about 15 minutes. 
We look outside and we see it walk in front of the fire they've made. Don't know what it is, one of them says. It looks like an ape. Suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it's not the thing. It's my landlord's dog. Just the body, though. No head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the doors and windows when we heard something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We heard metal and glass just get ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and then the guys were talking, making sure that the guns were ready. Someone handed me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again. Except it was now louder. It didn't echo or fade out because, now, it was inside. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as the thing did. It opened just a bit, but five or six men slammed into it. It got one of its hands through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that, put the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger, cutting its hand clean off. That only ticked it off, though. It started pushing on the door, clawing. We were on the other side, pushing as best we could, and it was doing so on the other side. That wood just wasn't going to hold, so someone told us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of the men just unloaded on the top of the door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door, or what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off of it. They put me in the hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long time. When I got home, I got a job from my landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him, right away, what the police told him. The story that they went with was a wild animal. Probably a wolf or maybe a bear had migrated north. I asked him how they could say such a thing when we had a hand. He looked at me stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove it into a tree, dying on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand even exist at all, Said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. The cops never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away, but I don't think that's what happened. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't do it even if the whole U.S. Army was at my back, but that was a lie. When my mother died, I didn't think my father felt he had anything left, and that he thought he might as well settle old scores. He went into those woods, and he never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me what they got a few calls about, those woods every year. About someone up and vanishing, but that's all that they wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of the team, he wrote, The Rake, onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I started searching for it on the internet. Honestly, I would rather have not known. Fate is a cruel mistress, and which everyone cannot avoid. Prolonging, perhaps, but it will eventually stalk you to the point in which it's impossible to negate. The story begins quite some time before the actual event itself. I was young, and my sister and I were staying at my grandmother's home, which happened to be located on a reservation. My dad's side is Native American, but he left some time ago and hardly ever visited. All that he has left is his mother, who isn't on good terms with my father. But my mother thinks it's important to still stay in touch with my grandmother. My sister Emma and I were about seven at the time. My mother dropped us off at the small home located practically in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Northwest. 
Rain and trees were abundant, where everything else seemed to be miles away. That included any types of stores and neighbors of any kind. My grandmother's home was average, but the land that she owned was quite large. She had a barn with an old single horse named Lady that roamed the fenced area of her land. We were never allowed to take Lady into the woods, but we would get to ride her on the dirt path that led into the nearest town to get groceries as long as our grandmother accompanied us with her old beat-up golf cart. Our grandmother was kind of careless about basic safety, but was oddly strict about keeping the traditions of her heritage. For instance, we were not allowed into the woods, on any circumstances. We weren't even allowed to whistle during the nighttime, regardless if we were inside or not. However, she smoked quite a bit in her presence, and left the fridge full of beer unattended. She even bought us a trampoline for her house, which we loved, despite my mother specifically requesting that she didn't after my sister broke her arm at a friend's house while jumping on a trampoline. During one of our visits, our grandmother got very sick. The doctor she normally saw in town must have been away on business. She told us to ride Lady into town and grab medicine for the illness that she thought she had. She was too sick to accompany us on this particular trip, but told us that Lady had made the trip hundreds of times before and knew the way. As long as we stayed on the horse and didn't talk to anyone, we should be fine. Most of the locals in town knew my grandmother, as well as her horse, so this shouldn't be a problem. Lady was a large enough horse for both me and my sister to ride, but for whatever reason, my sister insisted on staying back with Grandma, which for me was totally fine. I set out on a dirt path leading into the town after lunch in the cool afternoon. It was early springtime, but the weather still carried a slight sting in the air. I wore a thick sweater and jeans that blocked the chill for the most part. The trip into town wasn't too far for a car, but for a horse, it made it feel a bit longer than it probably was, but it did beat walking. Lady was old, so she took her sweet time. I was instructed to let her go at her pace since she was so old, and my grandmother didn't want to risk hurting Lady. Every now and then I gave a small nudge with my heel to keep Lady from basically falling asleep on the ride into town. In my distracted and bored mind, I started to sing songs not thinking about anything, as I was completely bored. After an hour of singing, my throat began to get sore, so instead, I started to whistle. I only whistled for about five minutes or so before I reached the town. I then tied Lady to a post near the pharmacy and went inside. It took about 15 minutes of talking to the intendant inside to get the materials that were listed on the paper that Grandma sent me into town for. I went back outside and loaded the materials into the saddlebag of Lady. My throat was still a bit sore from my personal concert on the way into town, so I resorted back to whistling. It didn't even faze me that this was something I wasn't supposed to be doing until I was about halfway back. It wasn't late in the day, but it didn't help that it was quite cloudy out. The thick woods that border both sides of the dirt path were incredibly dark. The landscape looked as if a cloud had descended and covered the area. This was common for this area of the United States. As I whistled, I heard an eerie repeating tune off in the woods, causing both me and the horse to stop on our tracks. My grandmother had warned me about whistling, but I figured that that applied more towards the woods or nighttime. Seeing how I was in neither made me first think that perhaps someone was watching me from the woods. At the very least, they must have been within earshot to be able to repeat the same tune that I was whistling. My adrenaline began to fill my veins as my senses became heightened. I tried my best to locate the source of the sound from the safety of my tall horse, but Nothing was distinguishable inside the fog. I barely made out the tree line which held even darker shadows within it. Instead of slightly nudging Lady, my nerves seemed to have applied more power than I initially intended, which caused Lady to take off with me alongside her. I had stopped whistling, 
The speed at which Lady carried us produced enough sound to block out anything for me to hear. It took us a fraction of time to arrive home, and surprisingly enough, despite the poor visibility, Lady got us there in record time. I took Lady immediately to the barn and locked her up for the evening, despite it only being five in the afternoon. I listened intently on the way inside for the sound of whistling coming from the woods, but thankfully, I didn't hear anything. I took the medicine inside to Grandma, and I didn't mention my slight blunder of whistling too close to the woods. Whatever it was that was mimicking my whistling was no longer behind me, which I was thankful for. Grandma took the medicine and was out for the night. My sister and I spent the rest of the evening by the television, watching one of the handful of channels that my grandmother had with her cable. My sister and I were not ones to stay up late, so around 9 o'clock we decided to turn off the television and got ready for bed. As we were getting ready and turning off the lights in the home, a familiar tune creeped through the air and into my soul. I stopped what I was doing to better listen to see if perhaps my sister had fallen for the same blunder as I did when I realized that the sound was coming from outside. Before I could say anything, my sister called out to me, asking if I was the one making that sound. I was too afraid to respond, and she asked me again while walking over to me from the other side of the house. She could see with the look on my face that I was not the one making the sounds. When she realized that someone else was outside, whistling, she began to cry. Our initial thought was that some crazed man was outside, trying to get us to come out by playfully whistling. The best thing that we could do was to go upstairs next to my grandmother's room and be as quiet as we could. That night was long, and whoever was outside was persistent. The whistling eventually became knocking, and for a brief moment, we could have sworn that the front door to the house jiggled. Thankfully, we remembered to lock the door as part of one of the rules that grandmother insisted we did every night when it got dark. The next day, our grandmother finally was well enough to get up and walk around the house. We didn't tell her about the person outside whistling since we thought we were going to get into trouble. Later that day, my sister and I made some excuse to have our mother come up and get us to go back home. We didn't want the possibility of having another terrifying night haunt us with no one but our grandmother to protect us. My grandmother called my mother to have her come pick us up, despite the many hours it took to get here. This is where I wish the story ended, but unfortunately, it didn't. Fast forward 10 years, much had changed between the time we last saw our grandmother to now. Firstly, my sister who had experienced the events with me had passed away four years ago in a car crash. She was the only person that knew what had happened that night and could verify everything. Next, my family had moved a good distance away, resulting in us not being able to visit since that night. To be honest, I don't know if anything ever resulted from the whistling, but I often thought about it. Lastly, I had just transferred colleges, only a few hours away, which ignited a choice I would soon come to regret, which was to come down unannounced with a few friends to check up on my grandmother, since we were passing through that way anyways. It had been so long that I had forgotten about the rules my grandmother had for us, so I didn't think twice that we drove down her dirt road around nine or so at night. We arrived at what I thought to be her house since I was basing it off of memory. We were just going to pop in very quickly, say hello, and leave. We pulled up to the house and sure enough, it was the one. The barn out back confirmed that this was indeed the place, but I didn't see Lady. Given the time that had passed, I figured that she had probably had died. The house had a few lights on, but when we knocked on the door, no one immediately answered. We waited a few minutes, and it didn't even dawn on me that my grandmother could have possibly moved or, heaven forbid, passed away and someone else inherited the house. All of these thoughts immediately came rushing to me when a strange man answered the door. Hello, said the old man whose face was partially covered by the door and the poor lighting on the front porch. 
His voice was that of a chilling nature, being deep and raspy. Uh, hi. Is Margaret here? She's my grandmother. The man was quiet for a moment, and even though I couldn't really see his face, I could tell that he was confused. Before I was about to speak again, he chuckled and said, Oh, of course. You must be Emma. That was not in fact my name, but rather my sister's, which I politely corrected. Ah, uh, yes. Come on in, the man replied and opened the door ever so slightly more. The female friends I was with gave off trepidatious glances, seeing that we were entering a strange man's home. We slowly entered the home and a light relief washed over me, and the home looked practically identical when I was a child. The usual decorations that my grandmother loved still laid in a similar position all those years later. He then guided us inside and told us to have a seat while he went to go get my grandmother. The house felt different than anything I'd ever experienced. Instead of the cozy small feel I was used to growing up, I felt on edge, as if at any moment the jump scare was going to happen, like in a horror movie. I could tell my friends were also feeling tense, but probably for other reasons. The man then went downstairs into the basement to get my grandmother, which I thought was odd. The basement, from what I remember, was unfinished and full of junk that my grandmother had acquired over the years. When the man left, my friends began to ask me if that was my grandma's boyfriend or something, which I didn't have a great answer for. As we were talking, I noticed an eerie side to the top of the staircase. I saw what looked like an old woman wearing some kind of black veil peer barely into sight. The sight was startling since I was under the impression that my grandmother was downstairs. So, who was this? I got up seemingly in a trance and walked over to the stairs and began to ascend them. Who was upstairs? Instead of following me, my friends got up and walked over to the front door and opened it. We're going to wait in the car, they said as they were clearly uncomfortable with the situation. I got to the top of the stairs and looked down the hallway to see a female entity glide into my grandmother's room. The entity was not touching the ground. This shocked me, and I stood there petrified with what I just saw. I was about to walk down the stairs when I looked down and saw that the basement door had just opened. I felt this random urge to hide behind the corner to see who came out of the basement before walking down the stairs. The door slowly creaked open and the man exited the basement while holding a long chain that dragged behind him. I could now hear the sound of something large coming up the stairs. All the while the old man sang, They came right to us. They would like to meet you. And a half chuckle. At the end of the chain slowly appeared to be a very large decaying creature that stood upright. The man guided the beast into the empty living room and was surprised to see that it was empty. He quickly ran over to the front door and cracked it open to see that my friends were still outside in the vehicle, idling. He yanked the chain hard to get the beast's attention and opened the front door while letting go of the chain. The beast quickly ran outside, and it didn't take long for the screams of my friends to reach my ears. The old man laughed hysterically as the screams from outside continued. I could hear the car starting to drive off, but it didn't get very far. The old man went outside and closed the door behind him. I was about to go down the stairs to lock both of them outside, but the apparition then appeared at the bottom of the stairs and shook its head. This minimal communication indicated that it was not in my best interest to lock the door. Instead, I turned around and went into my grandmother's room to hide. Her room looked incredibly dirty. The walls were yellow and her bed was covered with different types of stains. I made sure to close the door behind me and found the only place decent enough to hide, which was under her bed. It didn't take long for the old man and whatever that thing was to come back inside. I could hear them come in, but I couldn't hear any indications of my friends being with them, which was either a good thing or bad. The old man began to walk around the house, which... I assumed was to look for me. Thankfully, with the overflowing mess of my grandmother's room, my hiding spot was overlooked. 
The old man left the door to the room opened and continued his search throughout the house. The sounds of something eating and slurping downstairs gave me a brief idea of what had happened outside. A couple of hours had passed, and I found it safe to creep out from under the bed. In doing so, I was able to find a snub-nosed revolver under my grandmother's bed. I am not familiar with weapons, so I wasn't sure if it was loaded or not, but I kept it with me. I opened the door and peered out to see that the hallway was clear, so I ventured out over to the top of the stairs and looked down. Down the stairs and into the living room was a large wolf-like creature, feasting upon the remnants of my two friends. Despite the distance away, I could still smell the putrid smell of the creature just below me. The sound of a single whistled tune came from behind me. This caused me to jump and to turn around to see that the old man was behind me. I pointed the gun at him and told him to stay back, which he slowly started to walk towards me. I pulled the trigger and a small explosion erupted, sending the bullet in the direction of the man. The bullet hit center mass and small chunks of flesh flew out the backside of his body. He stumbled, but he didn't fall over. The sound was so loud that my ears began to ring. The next thing I knew, I was being dragged. There was a sharp pain in my shoulder, and I was being dragged head first down the stairs into the living room. Whatever the thing was had begun to shake me violently, making the already excruciating pain even more unbearable. I couldn't help but scream and to try to rid myself of what was causing this pain. Lucky for me, I was still holding the gun. I aimed the gun at the creature's head and began to fire. The creature paid the bullets no mind and grabbed me again with its row of sharp teeth. It shook me again making me drop the gun, as well as extremely disoriented. The old man from upstairs walked down into the living room and over to the basement door which he then opened. The creature then released me, only to now grab me with its claws by the ankle. It dragged me across the wooden floor which I tried scratching at which did nothing but hurt my fingernails. The creature then took me down the wooden steps and into the dark basement. The last thing I saw was the old man at the top of the stairs, wave, and slowly close the basement door. Story submitted by Strange One I know this video is old and no one will probably see this, but I wanted to share my own Skinwalker slash Wendigo stories. I have two from growing up in rural town in Washington State. I've never seen them, and honestly, I hope I never do. The first time was when I was four. We were living in a house with dense old woods behind it, with a steep 30-foot drop off into the river below, not 15 feet from the tree line. My mom didn't want me anywhere near those woods unless she was there watching me, which I understand now, but as a kid, I was so mad that I had all these woods right there that I couldn't be in. It was dusk. The sun was behind the trees in the mountains, but still lighting the sky. I had this yellow plastic tricycle that I had normally left under the covered patio we had, but for some reason it was now at the end of the driveway. My mom told me to go get it and bring my trike back under the patio, and being the independent four-year-old I was, I skipped out and down to the end of the driveway. The driveway was pretty long, and maybe it was because I was dragging my trike back as well. It seemed like it took a while to get anywhere. The sky was getting darker, and I heard the bugs and frogs go quiet when I was about two-thirds of the way back. Then I heard my mother's voice calling my name from the woods. I automatically responded with a, yeah? Come here, my mom said from the woods from behind my house. Thinking nothing of it, I parked my trike under the patio and started walking towards the back of the house. I had only taken a couple of steps before the logic part of my brain kicked in. My mom doesn't like being in the woods. Why would she be in the woods anyway? She was washing dishes last I checked and... She wasn't anywhere near being done. Then I realized it sounded off. It was my mother's voice, but it wasn't. It sounded forced and gravelly, 
like my mother when she lost her voice due to an illness for a few weeks. I felt so exposed, like Bambi's mother stepping out into the clearing, the hunter's rifle aimed and ready to fire. The final nail in the coffin was a clang of a dropped plate. My mother was inside washing dishes. I could hear her. Whatever was calling for me was not my mother. Panic flooded my veins and my breath choked in my throat. As I backpedaled without thought, I took two stumbling steps, afraid to take my eyes off the tree line when I heard my mother again. But this time, the mask was slipping. The voice was deeper, raspier, more animalistic as it roared. Strange, come here. With all the audacity of a terrified four-year-old, I cried. You're not my mom. Then I turned and ran. I flew across the patio, leapt up the stairs, kicking the front door open, and slammed it shut behind me. Sure enough, my mom was standing at the sink, plate in hand as she turned, placing her free hand on her hip and snapped. What the heck are you doing slamming my front door for, strange? What came out was a terrified flurry of words between sobs. My mom washing the soap from her hands, walking up to me and trying to comfort me. At my request, she locked all the doors and windows, and closed the blinds in the middle of the summer. I explained what had happened, and I could see the disbelief in her eyes. She told me everything was okay. Nothing was going to hurt me. She won't let it. While that was all well and good, what I wanted to hear was, I believe you, but it's going to be okay. I grew up thinking she didn't believe me. Two years later, I'm at a river in an even more rural area with my mom, her boyfriend, and his kid, my dad, his girlfriend, and her kids, and a couple of mutual friends. I had the time of my life, then it was time to pack up. We ended up staying at one of the family friends' lodge, which was also surrounded by woods. The place was creepy, and the friend kept showing me Bigfoot evidence, including tufts of hair that were obviously fake and plaster footprints cast that I could see the wooden patterns on the sides and I found the cutout too. I wasn't impressed, as you could probably tell. It came time to have dinner and retreat to our rooms. My mom told me to take my sandy crocs out to the covered deck, dust them off and leave them there to dry. A little nervous but not wanting to seem like a baby, I took the crocs out to the deck. The big heavy door shut behind me and I stood with my back to it. It was dusk again, and I could hear the frogs and crickets, and even smell the river. Everything seemed fine except for this pit in my stomach that I brushed off as anxiety of sleeping somewhere new. I bent over and began pounding the crocs on the deck to knock off the sand, thinking of my favorite song to comfort myself. Then, it was like I was hit in the face with a brick, but the brick was the smell of rotting flesh. Think weak old corpse left in a dumpster in the hot sun. My eyes watered and I choked and gagged. My face puckered and I stumbled back. I couldn't even think of what could be causing that smell, and why I would be smelling it now when I hadn't before. Because then I heard this loud thud on the roof of the covered deck, followed by three smaller thuds and the sound of something sliding. Like a dog or cat skidding out on hardwood floors, as whatever it was slid down to the edge of the roof. I haven't even noticed everything went dead quiet until that second. Then, I heard this horrifically loud screech that was too human to be an animal, and too animal to be human. It started as a low, deep growl like a bear, dog, or wolf, and yet none of the above. Then it slowly transitioned into this high-pitched shriek that sounded like a woman, or a child screaming in agony. This all transpired in about three seconds, but it felt like it lasted a lifetime. Once again, an almost paralyzing wave of terror washed over me as I stumbled back into the door, my hand flailing until I found the doorknob, and twisted it, the door popping open and I threw my body weight against it, dropping my crocs through the door as I dove through and slammed it shut behind me. I locked the door, hyperventilating as I turned around to see a sea of drunk adults staring at me like I'm insane. I frantically explained what had happened to me, and they all started laughing. Laughing like it's one of the funniest things that they'd ever heard before in their lives. One of the family friends calmed down enough to tell me that it was Bigfoot. He was going to break into my room and eat me. 
at the horrified expression on my face to begin cackling like a pack of wild hyenas, rolling around on the floor like something from a cartoon. My mom can see that I didn't find any of this very funny and start to feel guilty for laughing. She then tries to get me to say that it didn't actually happen and I'm lying for attention. I burst into tears, swearing that I'm not lying. I ended up getting no dinner that night as a punishment for lying after not eating all day and swimming for hours. Me and my mom still talk about this and how she had apologized 10 times over, saying she didn't know how else to handle it. I just can't get that sound out of my head and I can't stop remembering crying myself to sleep as I listen to them partying until the morning hours, feeling something watching me from my window. But being too scared to look and only feeling it leave when my mom stumbled in to go to sleep. My name is Brenna and I work as a paleontologist, which is someone who finds and restores fossils for a living. I really enjoy my job because it allows me to work with limited human interaction and because I genuinely enjoy finding new fossils. It's like working on an extremely hard puzzle in which you have to find the pieces. I always get a sense of accomplishment when I either put together an incredibly difficult creature or on the rare occasion when I find a new species. We were called to southern Utah in a remote section of national parks where rock formations and caves are prevalent. This place alone is home to so many unique dinosaur finds which often surprise people. When we go to locations like Utah, I bring a small team with me which is about three people, including myself, and we stay on site. Thankfully, my team consists of another girl named Katie, who's around my age, and an older gentleman that we call Papa John, who is in his early 60s. Papa John had been doing this gig longer than me and Katie had been alive. He was super cool to work with and was also a complete stoner, which makes our camping trips all the more enjoyable. When we would take the crib, we'd bring a camper with us and usually just stay in there together. Thankfully, Papa John isn't a creep, but rather a grandfather-like figure which makes sharing the same space for a few weeks bearable. Katie is like most girls where I'm not. I've been told that I give off a punk vibe, but I don't quite see it. It's probably because of my tattoos. Anyways, back to the story. We had been working on the side of this mountain one day, getting samples for a possible site to find more fossils, when Papa John goes for one of his walks, aka his smoke break. When I say smoke, I don't necessarily mean a cigarette. Instead of old John coming back with blazed eyes and a slight stagger in his step, he comes back out of breath and with excitement. Katie and I shoot her heads up to see he's holding something. It appears to be a small rock that had been cracked down the middle, encasing the remains of a fossil. Apparently his smoke break actually yielded results to our dig site, and he happened to stumble across a cool find. It wasn't the rock that excited him though, more so where he found the rock. He told us to follow him, which we did confusingly. He took us down this beaten path that lined the base of the mountain. The right side of the path had been overgrown with brush and sage, which made going down the path a bit of a squeeze. John was always good about finding good places to smoke so he wouldn't get caught. This was definitely the place to do it. As we continued to press through the intense brush, we eventually arrived at John's prized location at the base of the mountain. There was a large boulder that appeared to be covering what looked like an entrance to a cave. John was convinced that this cave was sure to have priceless fossils hidden inside. The only problem was that we needed to find a way to move this boulder. John, being old in age and not having any equipment with them, was not able to move the boulder, but he figured that me and Katie with a few pickaxes would be able to chip away at the boulder enough for one of us to slip inside. Looking at the truck-sized boulder, this would take us some time. I went back to the RV and grabbed two pickaxes and a shovel, while Katie and John stayed back. We started working on the boulder, but we were only able to work for an hour or two before the sun got too low. We figured that it would be okay to leave our tools here since the area was completely hidden. We were the only ones in the area anyways. We went back to the RV and had our typical evening of having a small dinner and playing cards. John smiled the entire night, ear to ear with excitement. 
He kept telling us the best finds of his career have always been in areas of shelter, much like a cave. Southern Utah was a hotspot for things like this. The night continued on with high energy and anticipation for what was to come of the cave. There was a good chance that we'd be able to find valuable minerals in there as well, depending on the age of the cave. John woke us up early the next morning with coffee and singing. He was ready to get the day started despite it still being dark outside. Nonetheless, this didn't stop the jolly man from handing us headlamps and skipping down to the cave. Katie and I were not morning people, however it was hard to stay mad at John for long. We made it back to the entrance of the cave where nothing seemed out of place. Our tools still remained in the same place as well as the menacing boulder that prevented our entry. Katie and I worked at chipping at the sides of the boulder while John dug at its base. The chipping seemed nearly pointless since the progress was so minimal. I was certain that the right people with the right equipment would be able to move this in mere seconds, but time nor money happened to be on our side. About halfway through the day, John was able to dig enough at the base of the boulder to make it shift about a foot. This was just enough to open a small hole near the bottom where the boulder met the cave. Although being a small opening, it was just enough to send one person in without any gear. John was too big and I had claustrophobia, so I definitely wasn't going into the entrance until the hole was bigger. This left it to Katie, who was always up for a challenge. She took off her gear and got on her hands and knees and tried wiggling her way in. She kept her headlamp on from earlier this morning and peered inside. She told us how large the cave was and that we definitely all needed to come in and explore it. We handed her her gear and told her that we'll keep working on the boulder without her while she explored. We told her to be careful and not to get lost. Caves were notorious for people going missing. We worked more on the boulder which took us some more time. Another hour or two and we managed to produce another four inches on both sides of the hole. This still wasn't enough for John to fit in, and I still wasn't comfortable trying to squeeze in with this size. We called into the hole for Katie to give us a quick update, but she didn't answer. We figured she was too far into the cave for her to hear us, and we just kept working. We worked a little bit more before John and I decided to take a quick smoke break. I really wasn't one for smoking, but I was tired, and I still needed a break. We just sat off the side of the boulder, and John and I lit a smoke. I drank a Powerade that had been in my bag while downing a cliff bar that had since melted from this morning. I was catching a bit of secondhand smoke from John's weed and I felt a little lightheaded. John and I were talking about music and other random things when we heard a muffled scream coming from inside the cave. We looked at each other rather confused and snapped out of our trance we had. John and I both ran over to the hole and peered inside while shining a flashlight. Katie, are you okay? John's genuinely concerned. However, we got no response, which was rather concerning. John looked to me with shock on his face. We need to open this cave right now, he said. A chill went down my spine when I said I'd go in just to check on her. John looked even more surprised. Bruna, are you sure? You don't have to do this. I know you have claustrophobia. We can work on the boulder some more, so you don't feel so claustrophobic. I sized the slightly bigger hole up in my mind, and I figured it was doable. Frankly, this was a lie. I took off my bag and put on my headlamp. The lamp wasn't very bright, but it was better than nothing. I started going in head first and I worked my way in. The cave immediately opened up once I got a few feet inside, which was reassuring. However, I felt pressure on all sides of my body while pushing through. This triggered my phobia and I began to slightly panic. I pushed through more hastily and finally made it in without having a full panic attack. I felt proud of myself. I was able to overcome one of my greatest fears that I had in a very much needed situation. I snapped out of my self-congratulations and began my search for Katie. The cave was tall and was somewhat wide, but completely dark save for the small hole of light I just entered from. The hole was able to illuminate about 20 feet or so, but anything beyond that was completely dark. I was able to notice that on the ground were footprints footprints who would have had to have been Katie's. This should make finding Katie rather easy for me, since the cave had yet to split in other directions, which caves were known to do. I made sure not to wander too far, yet I kept a watchful eye out for Katie. 
I called out her name rather loudly, since I had no need to be quiet. I was trying to find someone, so this was the best course of action. My cell phone obviously was not able to work, since we were in the cave, and it had poor reception. I kept following the footprints, which went deeper into the cave. The cave not only went into the mountain, but also on a downward slope. The cave's floor went from dirt to mud, and now to stone, which made tracking Katie's prints nearly impossible. I couldn't help but notice the temperature getting slightly more and more cold. This was fine, although I wasn't dressed for anything below 70 degrees. I also noticed that my senses were on high alert. I attributed this to my adrenaline pumping from my claustrophobic encounter from earlier. My hair stood on the back of my neck, and I now felt scared. I was deciding if the search would have to wait for John to open the cave more, and he could come inside, and that's when I heard it. That's when I heard a scream. Not Katie's scream, to be exact, but rather, something else. It didn't sound like Katie at all. It sounded like some type of large, predatory animal. I froze in my place, but I then realized that the cave system often had air circulate throughout them, creating strange sounds. I only knew this because I'd worked on an excavation that was once in a cave. The sounds can be terrifying, much like the one I just heard, but when you realize that when air is flowing through jagged rocks, much like the ones that were lining this wall, it makes sense. Essentially, it made the cave a giant death whistle. I was tempted to call out again to Katie, but the gust of wind that resembled a scream had caused me to no longer be as brave. I turned back to check up on John to see what progress he had made and also to alleviate some nerves that I had recently acquired. Thankfully, I hadn't made it too deep into the cave, so the walk back only took a few minutes. When walking back, I could see the light coming from the hole and movement from outside. Before I was within talking distance, I heard a rock fall deep from within the cave, roughly where I was just standing. Could this be Katie? I stopped in my tracks and looked both ways back to the entrance and then again to the sound that came from within the darkness. I decided to check in with John to let him know that I was okay and that I thought I heard Katie. I went over to the hole and I noticed that it was much smaller now. My heart sank. There was no way it was going to be able to get through this hole. John, what happened to the hole? I screamed. Sorry, Brenna, he shouted. When I was digging the boulder, it readjusted due to the soft soil. However, I heard Katie on the other side of the boulder. Brenna, I found a way out of there, she exclaimed. You just need to go deeper in and take a left at the large stalactite. From there, you'll be able to hike up and out near the camper. But be careful. I think there's something living inside. My fear became paralyzing. I know that Katie was just trying to help, but that information absolutely terrified me. I just considered waiting by the entrance until they were able to shift the boulder again. But that could take hours. Plus, I could tell that it was getting dark outside since the light that was coming in was much more dim. My thoughts raced about the gust of wind and the rock that fell from earlier. Hopefully that was the cause for the rock to fall and not some large animal that was going to eat me. I hiked a good ways into the cave, but I'd yet to see any mineral formations that even resembled a stalactite. Thankfully, my LED headlamp had fresh batteries from this morning so I could count on those for a few good hours of light before my light gave out. I walked further in and heard a wind of gust much louder this time. However, it didn't sound like the one from before. This time it had a whistle to it and actually felt the gust of wind. This was both good and bad since whatever I heard earlier might not have been a wind gust. However, this did mean that I was near a cave entrance. I pressed on further into the cave doing my best to stay calm and to find the underground landmark to guide me to the exit. But the further I went, the more I felt despair and hopelessness. I'm not exactly sure if this had anything to do with the cave itself or the looming idea of there being something malicious hiding in its depths. I did my best to try to stay silent so I could try to hear more wind gusts, but also to try to stay concealed in the darkness that surrounded me. Up ahead, I heard something. This time, it wasn't a gust of wind or a scream from some kind of animal, but rather, shuffling. As if something was walking on all fours and they were crawling throughout the cave, not knowing what to do since I had no way to defend myself nor anywhere to really run. I did the only thing I could do in my state of panic, which was to turn off my light. 
This was a huge risk, since most of, if not all animals that inhabit caves, have the ability to see in the dark. If this was the case, then turning off my light would only put me at a disadvantage. I had to act fast since whatever was coming at me seemed to be coming quickly. There was a good chance that whatever it was had already seen my light, but I had to try. I turned off my light and held my breath. The shuffling continued up until where I was standing, and it stopped. My heart sank and my blood froze. Something knows that I'm here. Instead of shuffling, I then heard the sound of sniffing coming from a small distance away. It was as if whatever it was knew I was there, but couldn't quite pinpoint exactly. I leaned up against the wall of the cave and ran my hands along the wall, hoping for something to try to climb up onto. I grabbed what felt like a solid hold that could elevate me up a few feet, and I silently started climbing. My feet felt around for any type of support to try to help lift me, but I felt nothing. I then pushed on the wall of the cave with both my feet and pulled myself up using non-existent upper body strength. The hold I was grasping with my shaky hands started to crack and completely disconnected from the wall. I then fell only a few feet, but it was enough to get the attention of whatever was sniffing. By whatever unfortunate circumstances that caused the rock to disconnect from the wall, fate now seemed to somehow be in my favor, as I was now holding a large rock in my hand. Before I could even register the pain from falling for those few feet, I was then grabbed by the creature. To my surprise, I was not met with sharp teeth, but rather, rough textured hands. Something grabbed my legs and let out a scream that resembled the sound I had heard earlier in the cave. My instincts kicked in and I swung the rock that I was holding in the direction of the scream, and instantly connected with soft tissue. But I also heard a cracking sound upon connection, then sobbing sounds. I was confused as I was under the impression I was being attacked by some kind of animal, but it was now crying. Did I just hit someone in the face with a large rock? My adrenaline was at an all-time high and I was very confused. I turned on my headlight not thinking about the situation, and I instantly regretted it. My light shined on what looked like a woman, but her hair was ragged and it covered her face. The woman was wearing pelts of fur from other animals which looked like they were rotting. The woman was clutching her face that was spewing dark red blood profusely. The woman was crouched down, which made her seem normal size, but when I tried to speak to her and apologize, she glanced over at me through her matted hair and stood up. The woman was grotesquely tall. I was more confused than anything by this. Her arms were long and connected to ungodly looking hands. Her hands had long brown fingernails that resembled claws. The woman was no longer sobbing and she removed her hand from her face, revealing that I had indeed smashed her in the mouth with a rock. Her sobbing turned into rage as she revealed her teeth that were now reddened and broken. My first hit with the rock was a miracle since I'm very uncoordinated. I tried to throw the rock at the woman but I was nowhere near hitting her. I turned and immediately ran. I could hear the woman behind me drop to all fours and begin pursuing me. The adrenaline was able to give me a quick boost of stamina, but it didn't last long. I heard the screams coming from behind me, but to my surprise, I also heard distant screams ahead of me. It was as if she was alerting others. As I ran, I then entered what appeared to be a large opening in the cave. To my horror, it revealed a horrific sight of more creatures like the woman. However, they seemed to be eating something and were rather distracted by my entrance. I could see that what they were eating due to the colors of the clothes of the person were bright and recognizable. They were eating Katie. Thankfully, the creatures were preoccupied with their current meal that they seemed to not care that I was in their place. I continued past the small group and pressed on into the cave looking for anything that could get me out of here. The woman, however, continued her pursuit despite being a good distance away. The woman, or should I say creature, was starting to make ground as I began to tire from fatigue. All seemed lost as I didn't really have anywhere to go. There was a good chance that this cave didn't even have another entrance. However, my light then caught a flash of a stalactite that hung right before the entrance of two caves. I remember Katie's instructions to take the cave to the left, which I did. The cave took a sharp left. Thankfully, the advice from Katie seemed to prove useful as I saw that the cave veered up and to the left. The incline was steep and the ground was wet from moisture, 
A light current of water came in slowly trickling in on jagged rocks, making my footing very slippery. I was then forced to go on my hands and knees to scale my way up without slipping. The wet rocks also seemed to slow the creature behind me enough to ascend without being attacked. I finally reached the top of the cave and to my delight, it led to another small opening that led outside. Thankfully it wasn't small enough to trigger my claustrophobia, but I did have to duck to get through. I went outside and saw that the exit was on the side of the mountain that seemed extremely out of the way. It was now nighttime and it was raining. I was able to quickly look around and see her camper a good distance away, and the lights were on. I wasn't sure if the creature was still behind me, but I didn't take any chances. I shuffled down quickly the steep mountain and sometimes having to slide down on my bum, which tore up my pants, but I didn't care at this point. I could now feel the pain of all the scratches and bruises my horrific pursuit had incurred. My hands were cut and my legs ached from the small fall and from all the running. I reached the trailer and fell down while banging on the trailer door. I was met by Papa John and by Katie. I was out of breath and I couldn't see anything for a few seconds. I pointed at Katie in confusion and I tried to explain what I saw in the cave. They were eating her. Katie and John both looked at each other and grinned at me with a wide smile revealing long sharp teeth. Both then started to convulse and shake wildly shifting into those creatures from inside the cave. They both grabbed me and rather than kill me right then and there, they began to drag me back into the cave. My dad died last year in a car wreck, which was a terrible tragedy. I was in my late 20s and I'm an only child, so I inherited a large portion of his inheritance. My grief-stricken mother received his life insurance and warned me to be smart with the money. I was working as a car cleaner at a local dealership, which paid barely more than minimum wage. I had gone to college but dropped out due to partying too much and sloughing on my grades. I was never one for school. I always thought it was for suckers that didn't know how the real world works. You didn't need to know how to use the Pythagorean theorem to start a company or to buy a house. Anyways, I've always had plans to start my own company. I follow a bunch of people on social media that have these rental properties and timeshares and make tons of money off of them. I figured that that's how I could actually make money and invest. Now was the time to do that. At first, I considered investing into crypto or random stocks like Tesla, but I figured that rental properties were the way to go, that even if no one were to rent them, I could at least live in them for a time being. I searched the local real estate listings for great properties that I could rent, but I was looking for quantity, not quality. Everything I was looking at at the time would run me dry, and I wouldn't even get two properties out of it. I needed something more off the grid, something I could buy cheap and build multiple units. I was driving late one night and I noticed on the outskirts of town that there was a large property with old rundown homes on it. There were about three homes with a trailer and other stuff on the property. I pulled off to the side of the road and got out to see if there was any listing for the property since it looked like no one lived there. It was around one in the morning or so and there weren't any lights coming from inside any of the homes so I figured that jumping the fence and taking a quick look would be fine. The fence was an old rusted barbed wire fence that had tons of slack on it, so I was able to easily step over it. I walked quickly with my smartphone out and turned on my flashlight feature. The more I walked onto the property, the more I saw trash and other garbage lying around. I noticed that there were two old looking cars that were around the late 1970s with rusted frames and non-existent glass in any of the windows. They were parked next to this old trailer that was missing a door. I skipped over the trailer since I was not interested in it, and would end up throwing it out anyways if I was given the chance. I took a quick look at the outside of the house, or what was left of the house, and knew right away that I wouldn't be able to use them since they were structurally unsound. However, despite not wanting to keep the house, curiosity did get the better of me, and rather than just accepting the house as being unsafe, I decided to take a look inside. The interior was equally unimpressive as it revealed a ruin result of a decaying home. At first glance, the walls were lined with graffiti and the floors were covered with trash. However, there was something off about the graffiti on the walls that began to give me a sense of dread. Normally, graffiti is random ramblings of curse words, slurs, and your occasional outlines of obscene images. However, this graffiti looked different. 
The markings on the wall looked more coordinated in terms of color and in style of images. After closely shining my smartphone's light upon the dirty brown walls, I then realized that the markings were symbols, all with different colors and shades of red. Some markings looked newer than others. I didn't want to say that the symbols were letters, but they were unlike anything I'd ever seen. Amongst the symbols were also very grotesque depictions of stick figures being subjected to what I can only describe as some type of evil force that would either torture or consume the stick figures in some way. These depictions also followed the same style that the symbols were drawn, as if the symbols in the drawings were all from the same source. After seeing no more than a few minutes of what I can only imagine to be mad rantings of an extremely disturbed person, I decided that what I was seeing was enough for me to leave. However, I was also compelled by a completely morbid side of me to take photos of these images, mainly to try to see if I could find the meaning of any of this on the internet. As I was taking photos and slowly making my way out of the home, I noticed that the symbols led me to a doorway that had a set of stairs going downwards. On the doorway, however, was written a word that I did understand. A word that both disturbed me, but also grabbed my attention in a way that I couldn't turn down, despite how terrifying it may have been. The word was... Hell. My body was telling me that there were unspeakable horrors awaiting me in the darkness that laid beneath, but my mind was all too curious. I shined my phone's light down the half dozen wooden steps and saw that the writings continued. My step on the stair let out a creak that shook every bone in my body. It was as if I was awakening the devil himself. I held my breath as I continued down, knowing fully well that I already made enough noise to alert anyone of my presence here. My descent down was exponentially worse. There was no moonlight coming in from broken windows to supplement additional light like it did upstairs. This basement carried a fog of darkness and an ever so slight tinge of hopelessness. The basement reeked of death and decay that smothered you like a dirty blanket that you couldn't remove. I could feel myself losing my mental fortitude, as if I would be enslaved to this basement forever. I reached the bottom of the stairs and, either out of habit or for a cry for help, I tried the light switch that laid at the bottom of the stairs. To my shock and pleasant surprise, the basement imperfectly illuminated a dirty yellow glow casting undeserved light on the wretched filth that inhabited the basement. The only light bulb that lit up the basement was next to another doorway in the corner of the basement. I could see old furniture covered with black mold and mounds of what looked like wet carpet in the middle of the floor. I noticed despite the mess that the floor in the middle had more writings, except these looked much more different than the ones upstairs. These looked like symbols from upstairs, but they were neat and organized in what appeared to be a perfect circle. I was preoccupied with the symbols on the floor and the light being inadequate for basic vision that I didn't realize that the wet mound of carpet that laid in the center of the circle was actually decayed flesh of an assortment of animals. That is, until my flashlight better illuminated the horrors before me. At that very moment, my eye caught movement ever so slightly coming from the doorway next to the light. I didn't see a demon or a serial killer with a hockey mask. What I did see was a long protruding arm reaching towards the single bare light bulb, grasping it with impossibly long fingers and crushing the bulb and the only other light source besides my pitiful phone. The bulb made a loud popping sound, causing me to jump and drop my phone into the mound of flash. Thankfully, my phone landed downwards where the light on the back was still able to cast light upwards. I didn't bother going for my phone at all, but rather, I ran through the basement, up the stairs and out of the house. The next thing I knew, I was outside and out of breath. I'm not entirely sure if I was followed or not, but nonetheless, the experience was one I never forget. I jogged back to my car, looking back at the home that hid those horrors beyond my imagination, half expecting to see some ungodly creature crawl out after me, but nothing. I stood half terrorized, yet also confused. Is it possible that I imagined that? Not the writings or the mounds of flesh, but the arm. The basement was dark and I couldn't see that well. Well, regardless. There was no amount of money that could have been offered for me to go back into that basement to retrieve my cell phone. Needless to say, I was no longer interested in this property. My name is Jocelyn, and 
heard some people say I am born with a gift, but it feels like a curse. I can see things, mainly people who have passed on from this life that still wander this world, also known as ghosts. Some do not know that they are dead, while others are bound to places or to people for whatever reason. I see them quite frequently, and I try to ignore them. If they know that you can see them, they will bother you, but if you ignore them, they will go away. Despite my gift and all of my experiences, this isn't a ghost story. It's something much, much darker. All of my life, I have learned to cope with my gift and almost found a way to rid myself of such a burden. I grew up in the city and would see just as many spirits as I would people, which made my developing years very difficult. It wasn't until I was around seven or eight until I realized that these spirits weren't actually a part of my physical world. For years, I have been seeing people that specialize in such areas to help reduce my connectivity to the spirit realm and connect to other things like nature. Nature has an effortless beauty that makes connecting to the world a pure experience. Me and my boyfriend moved into the country to better help get in touch with nature and to limit my connection with spirits that have passed. We moved to southern Idaho, just outside of a small town, about 10 years ago. The town was small, but had just enough of what we needed to live comfortably. During my time there, I maybe saw a handful of spirits that were just passing through, and I was able to lose most of my gift to see spirits. On the plus side to moving to Idaho, my boyfriend's family lives nearby. My boyfriend has two brothers, Riley and Caleb, both of which you would consider outdoor people that like their toys and to go camping whenever they could. They were both married to women that had very similar interests as us, making us natural friends, yet I didn't tell them about my gift. One brisk morning, we get a call from my boyfriend's brother, who lived down the street, saying that he wanted to take us out four-wheeling and go camping over the weekend. I was currently in between jobs, and my boyfriend had a very flexible job that made spontaneous trips like this possible. We would go camping all over, never in the same place twice. It was their family rule to always try something new, in order to live life to the fullest, or something. That's what they said, at least. This was fine, but it did make finding new places to camp somewhat difficult. I guess one of the brothers was able to find a place that looked perfect to ride dirt bikes when he was on a logging site that they ended up having to abandon for unknown reasons. We are giving coordinates to this camping site by one of the brothers. It's basically in the middle of nowhere. Riley tells us that he's able to get off work early and that he'll go and set up camp for us. We pack up and drive to where the coordinates take us, and we arrive at this dirt road that leads us into this heavily wooded area. The coordinates that he gave us were very specific. Without them, we would not be able to find this trail since the Google Maps yielded us no results. I could see why a logging company would be interested in this area. As we drove down this dirt path, I began to feel uneasy, a feeling I haven't felt in some time. I sense as if I'm about to see a spirit, but I don't see anything. It has been many years since I've felt like this, so it catches me off guard. We can't stay here, I tell my boyfriend. I have a bad feeling. He stops driving and seems concerned. Can you see anything? He asks. I look around the area, trying to see where this feeling is coming from, but I can only see trees. Well, no, not exactly, I respond. He nods his head and says, Well, let's at least give this a try. Maybe the feeling will go away. The deeper we go into the woods, the feeling gets worse. I'm about to say something again, but we finally see Riley and Caleb's campsite. My boyfriend seems excited and pulls into the campsite next to their trucks that are hauling four-wheelers and dirt bikes. Upon arriving to the campsite, I see it. I can see a spirit of what seems to be an old man standing right next to our campsite. I immediately freeze as I'm reminded of my gift. 
It had been many years since I was able to see a spirit, so I was caught off guard. But I tried to play it off as no big deal. The old man's ghost is greatly disfigured. It looks as if it was mauled by some sort of animal that lived in the woods. I noticed the clothing of the spirit. It was somewhat modern, which told me that the spirit had recently passed away. The spirit of the old man didn't say anything. It just stood there, covered in blood, and put his finger to his lips, as if he wanted me to be quiet. As this happened, I was then greeted by my boyfriend's brothers, Riley and Caleb, as well as their wives. This brief distraction caused me to lose focus on the old man, and when I looked back to where he was standing, he was gone. In the past, when I would see spirits, I would do my best to ignore them. However, I was perplexed as to why the ghost wanted me to be quiet. I felt as if he was trying to warn me. The feeling of darkness seemed to lift ever so slightly, but still hung in the air like the smell of earth after a heavy rain. The sun was beginning to set, so my boyfriend asked me to help get her stuff set up. Hey Jocelyn, a little help with the tent? He said while messing with one of the tent poles. I walked over and debated on telling him what I saw, but I felt like if I did that, it would be ruining the trip for everyone. I swallowed my conflictions and decided that since the spirit of the old man was gone, that he would hopefully stay away. There was no need to worry anyone. Soon after we got the tent up, we walked over to the group who was surrounded by a cozy fire that illuminated a small cove of trees that it was under. The sun had not completely set, but the trees took away what little light it had to offer. In terms of seclusion and beauty, we had certainly found the perfect spot. The area was fairly damp due to a recent rain which made finding new firewood a bit of a task. Most of the trees nearby were green with life, so finding any dried up branches or fallen logs would require us to venture out of our small bubble of light and safety and into the darkness. Thankfully, Caleb was insightful enough to gather a small bundle of wood prior to us arriving. However, the bundle would not last us all night. The fire burned a bright glow that, combined with the pleasure of the company that surrounded it, melted the feelings of darkness and danger away. I was good friends with Riley and Caleb's wives, so we were able to hit it off rather easily. We hung out around the campfire, having a good time drinking beers, catching up since the last time we saw each other. The boys were busy inspecting the motorbikes that they towed along to make sure that they were ready for tomorrow. After what felt like a while, and perhaps too long, we finally came together to start cooking dinner. Thankfully, we brought a propane stove, but the fire was nearly dead. We assigned Riley to cook our burgers while we all went out to find more firewood. My boyfriend and I ventured off into the dark woods. I had a bright blue LED light that seemed to pierce the thick fog that hung in the air, providing a small cone of artificial light. The ground and the nearby trees were still wet from the rain earlier. This made finding firewood very difficult. We figured that the further we ventured, the higher chance we would find some dry wood. While we hiked, I decided to share what I saw earlier about the spirit of the old man. My boyfriend seemed shocked, since it had been years since I'd seen one. He probably thought that I'd lost the gift at this point. He stopped walking and looked at me. Jocelyn, are you going to be okay? What do you think the spirit wants? He asked. I told him I wasn't sure. I left out the part of the spirit telling me to be quiet. I figured it wasn't important. I told him I think I'll be fine, but I got a bad vibe from these woods. A light rain began to fall as I was telling him, and we raced back to the campsite, empty-handed. We were the first to come back, other than Riley, who stayed back to cook. Riley welcomed us back, although he gave us a hard time for not bringing back any wood. The group slowly came back, one by one, with wet wood. Everyone except for Caleb. We didn't notice too much since we were trying to stoke the fire with wet wood. After we got the fire roaring again, we noticed that Caleb hadn't come back. We were about to start eating dinner without him when he finally returned. Caleb was one of those guys that was never afraid of anything 
or at least that's what he said. Something definitely spooked him out in the woods, because he could not stop looking over his shoulder, as if something was following him. When Caleb finally got back, we asked him, Caleb, what took you so long? You could tell he was conflicted with the answer he was about to give. He hesitated and waited, and then said, uh, it's nothing. Most of the group disregarded what he said, but I didn't. I felt the same way. I felt uneasy. We finally then had dinner, which was delicious. Riley did a great job on cooking the food. As we had dinner and started talking, the bad feelings seemed to evaporate. Whatever made Caleb feel uneasy out in the woods was clearly not bothering him anymore. A couple of hours passed and we continued to have a good time. I don't know who it was, but someone suggested that we tell the scariest story that we know. Personally, I don't like scary stories since I practically live one every day. Despite me not liking them, I did not object. We decided to go in order, giving each other enough time to think of a scary story. I started and I told some story about a golden arm or something that I heard when I was in girls camp many years ago. I didn't remember all the details and I think I botched the ending, but nonetheless, everyone seemed to enjoy it. We finally got around to Riley, who told us a scary story about skinwalkers. This instantly made me uneasy, since I believe in them. I believe in them to the point that I won't say their name. I think that it somehow draws them to you. As Riley was telling his story about, well, you know, I could tell that Caleb was looking around camp and over his shoulder. He was feeling uneasy again. Riley finally finished his story, which felt like forever, and everyone was on the edge of their seats. I think the mixture of the story, as well as the environment that we were in, made it extra scary. We finally decided to call it a night, around 1am. We wanted to get up early and ride dirt bikes. As we were going to bed, I couldn't help but notice that Caleb was shining his flashlight off into the woods, as if he was looking for someone. The night was difficult for me. I found that every sound out in the woods made me jump and I couldn't quite fall asleep. My sleep was disturbed throughout the night and I woke up exhausted. In the morning we started breakfast as usual. Everyone seemed to be exhausted from the lack of sleep, especially Caleb. I remember at one point Caleb asked, did anyone else hear that sound off in the woods last night? It sounded as if someone was screaming. Everyone looked surprised, but no one can confirm that they heard the sound as well. Despite the events and our lack of sleep, we decided to stay and ride our dirt bikes throughout the forest. As I was eating breakfast, I could see the spirit of the old man again. He continued to put his finger to his lips, as if he wanted me to be quiet still. But, this time, he did something different. He finally spoke to me and said, it knows you're here. The spirit then disappeared. I sat in complete awe of what just happened. What was the spirit trying to warn me of? I finally come back to reality and I see that everyone is starting to put on their riding gear. Normally I'm all for riding, but considering the circumstances, I do not want to leave the camp. Thankfully, one of the brother's wives was a couple months pregnant so it was the perfect excuse for me to stay back and keep her company. The group decides that they'll ride for a couple of hours and then meet back up at noon for lunch. I stay back at camp and just keep an eye at the fire as well as talking with one of the wives. Noon eventually rolls around and everyone but Riley shows up for lunch. Knowing Riley, this was his typical behavior. He was a bit of a wild card. I ask if we should wait for him before we have lunch, but my boyfriend tells me that he probably found this awesome trail and that he's not hungry anyways. The group then eats lunch and leaves before Riley can return. No one seems to be worried about Riley other than me. Later in the day as I'm sitting back at camp, I finally see Riley, but he's not riding his dirt bike, he's walking. I notice that his clothes are bloodied and tattered. Riley seems to be walking fine, but I notice that. Something is off about Riley. 
that bad feeling I felt earlier comes back ten times worse. Naturally, I am concerned about Riley's condition since he seems bloodied. But, before I can say anything to him, the old man's spirit appears next to Riley, and Riley can see him. Riley doesn't say anything. He just stares at the old man and looks back at me. He puts his finger up to his lips and goes, shh, before both of them disappear. It finally dawned on me what has happened. Something killed Riley in these woods, and he came back to warn me. The wife that stayed back that was pregnant was taking a nap, so I didn't want to bother her, and everyone else was out riding. The hours dragged on as I waited back at camp alone. I made sure to keep the fire going, and I collected enough wood to last us many nights. The group finally returned after what felt like a lifetime. I ran out to greet them and was going to tell my boyfriend what I saw, but to my surprise I saw Riley being assisted by my boyfriend as Riley struggled to walk normally. I immediately screamed to my boyfriend that he wasn't with Riley but with something else. Naturally my boyfriend was confused and stopped walking. He started walking towards me and asked, what did you say? Riley was now on the ground and he was convulsing. I ran up to my boyfriend and I whispered loudly in his ear, I saw Riley's spirit. He's dead. I don't know what that is. That isn't Riley. My boyfriend took a step back and asked me, Jocelyn, have you been drinking today? Before I could give an answer, the thing that was impersonating Riley started to shapeshift and let out a loud scream. The group began to immediately panic as they saw the horrors unfold in front of them. The creature began to look less like Riley and more like an emaciated werewolf. Caleb was thankfully right next to his truck and was able to go inside and pull out his shotgun. He let out three shots but unfortunately were not effective at that range. The creature for some reason was particularly drawn to me and started to charge at me. At this time Caleb was able to close the gap and was much closer. He let out two more shots, one of which hitting solid. A good chunk of flesh blew off the creature, and it was enough to scare it off into the woods. We were all left there in silence. We were completely stunned as to what just happened. Something was able to kill Riley, and even worse, was to take his form. Had his spirit not come back to me and tried to talk to me, I probably would not have noticed the difference. We obviously got out of there in record time. We called the police and told them what had happened. At first, the authorities thought that we were either on drugs or drinking. Granted, our story was rather out there, but nonetheless, it was the truth. The authorities finally believed us, at least enough to send out a search party, but we never did find Riley's body. We did find his new dirt bike, although it was mangled up pretty badly. As long as this story is, this unfortunately is not the end. Looking back, my boyfriend and I both think that, since he told us that story about skinwalkers, that he was targeted by one. We have made a promise to each other not to say the name. Life as we know it has never been the same after. We have missed Riley dearly and, and I've started to have these really awful nightmares about that creature. My sleep pattern has gotten worse and I've been told by my boyfriend that I start to sleep talk. The dreams have gotten so severe at certain points that I have woken myself up from screaming. Unfortunately, one night I was jolted awake by my boyfriend who was shaking me. He woke me up and said, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, do you know what you just said? I tried my best to wake up, but I was still dazed and confused. Jocelyn, you just said the word. You just said, Skinwalker. I could feel a heavy weight on my stomach as I realized what had just happened. I'd accidentally said Skinwalker in my sleep. Now only time will tell what will happen to me. Having seen the success of Operation Windigo, Agent Borsky was hand-selected for a special reclamation project named Dark Reach. For most of the materials of the operation, Dark Reach was considered classified since it was an ongoing operation, but some exceptions were made to fill in Agent Borsky. 
Long story short, a secret science base in the middle of nowhere had been compromised by unknown combatants. Asia Borsky sat skeptical when reading the mission briefing. How do we not know who the combatants are when it's a secret science lab? Surely we must have some idea of who these people are. The mission director was amused by Borsky's intellect and boldness. You're right, Borsky. We do have an idea with who is responsible, but nothing definitive. Since I have the clearance and the authority, I'm going to level with you. In 2009, our scientists made a breakthrough with time and space technology. They were able to create a portal to another dimension, or so we think. We have sent some people through with equipment, but the equipment is always immediately destroyed, and no one has ever returned from the portal. We think the conditions in the other dimension are too harsh for human life, so we took another approach. Borsky's eyes were wide with dismay. So who are the combatants taking over this lab? An advisor leaned over to the mission director and whispered something for a few seconds. The mission director nodded and said to the advisor, You're right, he deserves to know. Long story short, the director told Borsky that the only thing that they could think of that could survive difficult environments would be something that could shapeshift. They just so happened to have collected an asset from the National Park Skinwalker incident, and they used that to send through the portal. They're guessing that what has ever happened on the other side of the portal has caused the creature to adapt to this unearthly thing. We're going to send you in there and just make sure that the portal is turned off. It's a simple assignment, but you will have to go alone, and there will be no backup. Borsky was surprised by the no backup. Why don't I get any backup? The mission director responded and said, There's a good chance that whatever this thing is will manipulate your mind and shapeshift into your partner. That's why we have to send you alone. Borsky nodded and accepted the mission. They were able to give him gear needed for the mission, and they were able to relocate him out to the secret lab. The lab's entrance was well hidden, but also guarded by multiple people carrying machine guns. The lab looked like a door that was simply on the side of a hill. If there weren't any people there guarding it, he wouldn't have thought anything of it. Borsky was loaded with a machine gun, as well as wearing body armor just in case anything happened. One of the guards told him right before he entered not to talk to it. He took the advice and went inside. Upon entering the heavily sealed door, he could hear the latches close behind him, sealing him inside. He noticed that the power to the facility was off, and that he was immersed in darkness. Thankfully, he had an LED light on the end of his rifle, so he turned it on. He continued down the long hallway. He was thankful to see the red glow of emergency lights above. It must have been the backup power. Porsky was able to notice that the further he went into the science base, the more sticky the ground was beneath him. Not a great sign. There was no personnel left over in the lab so he had to slowly make his way through on his own. Borsky's attention was at high alert. He was keeping his eyes peeled for that creature lurking in the darkness, but thankfully he saw no signs of it. He was hoping that he would just find the portal, shut it off, and get out of there without having to see or hopefully talk to that creature. That hope, however, was dashed when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hallway. Identify yourself, he shouted down the hallway but no response. He slowly stepped closer and closer, hoping that one of the scientists were able to survive. Right before he was able to identify what he was looking at, the creature or thing bolted off to the left down a long hallway. Borsky tried to give chase, but was soon caught off guard when he looked down one of the hallways and saw a door glowing orange. Before he could walk down the hallway, he heard a voice in his mind. Adrian. I don't want to kill you. Adrian was Borsky's first name, which no one ever referred to him as. Adrian, you need to leave the portal alone. Humans need to suffer. Borsky responded out loud. You know I can't let you do that. I have to shut it off. Adrian slowly inched his way down the hallway while talking to this creature. The portal has shown me so much, Adrian. You should see as well. You know it will kill me. I can't do that. Adrian continued to step closer and closer to the door. The orange glow of the door got brighter. 
Borsky was about 10 yards away from the door when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hall. Despite the figure being at the end of the hall, he knew immediately what it was. It was his mother, right before she'd gotten in a car crash. She was even wearing the outfit that he last saw her in. She didn't speak out loud, but in his mind. Adrian, dear, please don't do this. You can come back to me. The portal will send you back to me. His mother continued to step closer and closer, slowly down the hall. Borsky lowered his weapon just enough so he wasn't pointing his gun at her. Can it really send me back? Is it possible? He responded. Yes, yes, it most certainly can. Don't turn it off. The figure that looked like his mother was now close enough that he could see the features of her. Her skin looked bloated, her eyes were dark and black, her limbs looked twisted and out of place. The image of her was so repulsive that it immediately snapped Borsky back to reality. He immediately raised his rifle and began to fire. He unloaded his magazine into what was clearly not his mother. The creature immediately began to flail and scream while running down the hallway. Borsky made a dash for the room with the orange glow. Upon entering, he was able to see what was clearly a portal to another dimension, or at least what looked like one. Borsky was able to quickly discern what was the power source for this device, and immediately shut it down. Upon doing so, he quickly left the room and made his way back to the entrance. This would mean that he would have to go back into the hallway with that thing and make it all the way back. Borsky quickly left the room and sprinted back all the while hearing screams that were a mixture of his mother, as well as some feral beast. He stopped to look behind him and shined his flashlight, not seeing anything, but hearing the screams getting louder and louder. It sounded as if whatever it was was getting closer to him, but he couldn't see anything. To his complete horror, he was able to shine his flashlight up and see that the creature was crawling on the ceiling in the image of his dead mother. This was the most horrific sight he'd ever seen in his life. Borsky was completely stunned in fear. The creature then lunged at him before he could react and pinned him to the ground. Right before the creature was able to bite his throat, a jolt of electricity shocked the creature in the neck and it jumped back. Lights to the lab turned on and personnel filled the hallway. Multiple agents with weapons came out of the doors and were quickly able to subdue the skinwalker. Out of the crowd of agents came the mission director, smoking a cigar. Agent Borsky, you successfully completed the simulation. Congratulations. Typically, when you go through something so traumatic and horrifying, your mind has a way to block those events to keep you from further suffering. However, I remember the events as if it was yesterday. It was a brisk October day with orange and brown leaves littering the streets and sidewalks. The temperature was a perfect chill to where you could almost see your breath. I would be going on a scout trip with my troop and some friends from school who weren't scouts but still wanted to come on the trip despite making fun of me for being on the Boy Scouts. The trip was a 10 mile hike round trip, two nights and three days. This took place back in the early 90s before the internet was on everyone's cell phone and technology took over our lives. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the modern conveniences that technology provides, but it also took away some personal feeling from the world. Mr. Dawson was our scoutmaster. He was an old man that looked jolly but was anything but. He wore suspenders since most belts were not able to accommodate his spare tire. He had a grizzly white beard that had streaks of gray in it, and almost always wore an Indiana Jones styled hat. He was a tough man and rather strong for both his age and appearance. Despite him being an old miser to just about anyone, he did love scouting and raising boys and turning them into men. Alongside Mr. Dawson, we had an assistant scoutmaster who was more understanding when it came to the youth. Mr. Carlson was a younger man in his late 30s who wore big old glasses and always tucked his shirt in, no matter what type of pants he was wearing. I think Mr. Carlson was an accountant of some kind, but he was always a party. We all loved him. 
Thankfully, having both leaders made our troop very well-rounded, with both growing experiences and also fun ones. Mr. Dawson was retired and divorced. I think he had one or maybe two children, but he never spoke of them. As unfortunate as that was, he almost always came on all the scout trips, while Mr. Carlson could only come on some of them. Mr. Carlson and his wife were members of my church, and they recently had a child. This would require Mr. Carlson to sometimes stay back and help with the baby. On this trip, however, Mr. Carlson would miss the first night, but hike up on the second day and meet up with us. Apparently, Mr. Dawson had an old friend that had a cabin somewhere, and he allowed the troop to stay there for a couple of nights. The troop, as well as myself and my school friends, were very excited. We have never been on a hike this long before. Normally, if we were lucky and none of the parents volunteered to come, Mr. Dawson would let us shoot his 9mm pistol that he would carry on his suspenders while camping. He also carried a double barrel shotgun in the back window of his truck, but he never let us shoot it. We all met at the parking lot after school down at the local grocery store where Mr. Dawson's old green truck sat idling. He sat inside smoking cigarettes. He was a smoker but never smoked near us. The troop trickled in over the next 15 minutes, including Mr. Carlson and his old Honda minivan. He only came for this night since we needed the extra seats to drive all the scouts up to the campgrounds. Once all the scouts arrived, we loaded all of our bags into Mr. Dawson's truck bed and divided the scouts into both vehicles. My friends and I preferred riding with Mr. Carlson. The younger scouts, as well as some of the outcasts, were subjected to Mr. Dawson's truck where he only listened to political talk radio and talked about old war stories that were not very interesting. We caravaned both vehicles loaded to the brim with both scouts and materials to the local campgrounds on the outskirts of town. We were kind of in a hurry since we were in a race against time to get to the cabin before the darkness fell, but we had plenty of daylight if things went to plan, which in scouting, they never do. Mr. Carlson dropped us off with some of our stuff and told us that he'd be up there the next day with some peach cobbler. His peach cobbler was a hit with everyone and brought even a smile to the old grumpy Mr. Dawson. We set off to the cabin in which Mr. Dawson instructed that the two oldest scouts to guide us there using an old map and a compass. Mr. Dawson led up the rear to make sure that none of the scouts didn't venture off the path or fall behind. The thing about Mr. Dawson is that he knew the way to the cabin. He had been there multiple times, in fact, but he wanted to give the scouts an opportunity to earn the orientation merit badge. For him to do that, he was not going to interfere unless it was getting too late or someone was hurt. Unfortunately, we had plenty of time before the sun was going to set, and the two scouts leading us were not geographically inclined. The two scouts began leading us, and the rest did not contribute anything constructive in terms of directions, but we did liven the spirits with talks of sports and jokes. Mr. Dawson remained quiet. The path at first was clearly laid out and had signs for the first bit, but the further we went into the dense forest, the more things began to blend in. We finally came to a fork in the path. There was no sign signaling which way was north, which is where the cabin was. The two scouts tried using the compass, but both paths seemed to be going either northwest or northeast. After two minutes of exchanging the map between the two scouts, one of them spoke up and asked Mr. Dawson for a hint. He shrugged and chuckled. I'm not the one getting the mare badge. If you want it, you gotta get us to the cabin before it gets dark he said in his old southern accent. The scouts ahead of us eventually picked the path to the right. We continued hiking, but this time we were less sure of where we were going. Our packs began to feel heavy, and despite the cool air, I for one was beginning to sweat. It was around this time that the noise in the forest began to have a strange eeriness to it. The birds that were still out this time of year didn't seem to favor this part of the forest. My anxiety was climbing, 
more so from being lost rather than the change in environment that we are now entering. The path began to take a significant incline as we ventured further in. It was at this moment that we all began to hear a very strange sound. It was distant but familiar. My mind immediately jumped to the worst case scenario. It sounded like someone crying out in the woods. The scouts and even the leader began to slow down as we didn't know what to do. The closer we got, the more we realized that this crying was coming off the path and into the woods. We could see not too far off that there was an old decaying cabin that seemed to be the source of the noise. Normally, most people would ignore this and continue on. Too many red flags. However, this was different. We were Boy Scouts, and we were supposed to help people. The cabin was the biggest concern. If it looked normal, then we would have left, but since it looked abandoned, then we had to make sure that there wasn't someone in trouble. At this point, Mr. Dawson got involved. I'm going to take four scouts, and we're going to go investigate. The rest of you scouts stay here so we don't lose the path. We all agreed, and he picked me and three other scouts to come with him. The cabin was covered in moss, and the wood looked old and twisted. The frame itself was slanted and looked unsafe to enter. The sound was more clear, and it sounded like an infant crying. Mr. Dawson did something that I'd never seen him do before. He unholstered his pistol and walked around the cabin perimeter calling out to anyone inside. No one answered and the crying continued. He went into the cabin and we followed. It didn't take us long to find the source of the noise and to our shock we realized that it was coming from an old radio that wasn't plugged in. One of the scouts turned off the radio and asked, how is this possible? Mr. Dawson looked around with a look of attentiveness. We need to leave, he said. Right then the radio came on again, but this time it wasn't the crying sound. It played this eerie tune that I'd never heard before. The sound was unlike the crying was distorted and warped, much like the rest of the cabin. We tried turning it off, but we had no luck, so we just left. When we got back to the trail, we were questioned by the other scouts and asked what was going on if there was a baby down there. We told them that it was just this old creepy radio that we couldn't turn off. As creepy as it was, none of us really paid it any mind, especially since the one camping trip where an old woman was tweaking on drugs out in the woods, and we had to get the police involved. That creepy music kept playing, and Mr. Dawson took us back down to the fork in the path and led us up the correct way to the cabin. The hike took a bit longer than we anticipated, but thankfully, the cabin was prepped for all of us, so all we had to do was unload our stuff and gather some firewood to start the dinner. The cabin was equipped with a fireplace stove, so we didn't have to build a fire circle and cook outside. This made us feel a false sense of security, especially after the incredibly odd situation that we had just encountered on the trail. It didn't take us long to gather all the firewood that we could possibly need for the trip, since there was a good number of us and we were all hungry. As we were gathering the firewood, the sun slowly began to creep behind the horizon abandoning us to what horrors the night had to offer. We brought the firewood to the cabin, leaving most of it outside since it would have made a mess. Mr. Dawson was quick in starting the stove, and we were cooking in no time. The stove acted as a heat source for the cabin, which was nice, since the early autumn coolness was beginning to be more chilling in the evening. It took all of us a couple of minutes to be able to cook all of our food, Due to the sheer amount of scouts and the limited size of the wood-burning stove, we made makeshift seats around the stove and we enjoyed our meals as they came off the stove, one by one. As we were eating, we naturally began talking. We talked about events in our lives, school, sports, Bigfoot, whatever 12-year-olds talk about at that age. I can't remember who brought up the old radio. The atmosphere in the cabin went from a playful bliss to a more sobering, dreadful result. It wasn't so much the topic itself, but rather the theories surrounding the event. Why would a radio station be playing crying sounds? One of the scouts asked. I don't know of any station that just plays bizarre sounds. How was the radio even playing? It wasn't connected to a power source, and I didn't see it have batteries, another scout mentioned. Mr. Dawson, while cooking up his meal, mentioned that he had heard of things like this before as a war tactic play a sound of someone in help, 
whether a comrade or a helpless child, and draw in the enemy, into an unsafe area to ambush them. That explains why he walked around the old cabin with his gun out. We slowly shifted talking about theories of what could have been trapping us to scary stories. This was way before Creepasta Wiki or horror channels on YouTube. The stories that we were sharing were either first-hand accounts of ghosts or cryptids out in the woods or abandoned buildings. We all took turns having the spotlight of telling scary stories when Mr. Dawson shared with us a truly terrifying story. It was when he was younger and helping his uncle move cattle across the open plains. He said it took them about a week or so to move all the cattle from one town to the other, where they would sell them in bulk. His job was to take a head count every night to keep track if they lost any cattle that day. If they lost any, then his uncle would go back and backtrack and try to find them during the night. All the cattle were equipped with very loud bells, which made finding them quite easy, but sleeping near them very difficult. On the first couple of days of the cattle drive, the company began to notice that at night, something would be disturbing the cattle into a small frenzy, causing everyone to be woken up by the commotion. After a quick investigation, they would find that one of the cows had been attacked by something with large claws and was still bleeding. The wound was so severe that the cow was bound to die, either from infection or blood loss, so they ended up putting it down. Mr. Dawson explained that he had never seen a wound like that before. His only thought was that it must have been a bear of some kind, but he had never seen or even heard of bears being in that area. He then explained that he found himself having a hard time trying to sleep outside since he was exposed to whatever had injured that cow for the rest of the week. He had his theories on what he thought it could have been, but he wasn't for sure. The scout's eyes were wide and full of fear as the dim fire of the wood-burning stove began to slowly get lower. An unsettling silence fell on the group as they all considered the wide varieties of monsters and beasts that still could roam the open dark places of the world. Mr. Dawson then let out a shout to get the scouts to scream. The screams were shortly followed by laughter by both the scouts and the scoutmaster. The laughter eventually led to a silence as the scouts scoured their minds for the next scary story to share when they all began to hear a familiar tune not too far off into the distance. The cabin provided a decent amount of soundproofing, however the unnatural tune found its way slithering through the cracks and frame of the cabin like some old venomous serpent coming to bring ill tidings. It took the group only but a moment before dread had struck them all in the gut. The sound that they were hearing was the same song on the radio that they had encountered earlier that day. White here, Mr. Dawson said while standing up, unholstering his pistol again and opening the cabin door. He wasn't out there long before he came back in. The eerie tune crept off into the night, out of earshot, yet the bad feelings that had dragged here remained. All of our ears strained to hear more of the music, but it was gone. Out of earshot, yet the bad feelings that had dragged here remained. All of our ears strained to hear more of the music, but it was gone. At this point of the evening, we decided the best thing to do was to stock up on firewood, keep it near the stove, but most importantly, keep the cabin door closed. Mr. Dawson took the only available room to sleep in while the rest of the scouts spread it out their sleeping bags around the dim but still warm wood-burning stove. The smooth crackling of the fire provided a calming effect to our young minds. However, the treacherous evil we had encountered earlier still dwelled in the shadows of uncertainty. No amount of security could make us feel safe while out in these woods, but the log cabin door would have to do. Our nightly routine of inappropriate jokes was sidetracked as none of us wanted to disturb the quiet air that kept us hidden inside the cabin. Despite the high anxiety and fear that we all were experiencing, the five miles we hiked up to this cabin had taken its toll on us. Much like the fire in the stove, our minds slowly dwindled into darkness, and we all found ourselves fast asleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but I do remember waking up. It felt as if I hadn't even fallen asleep in the first place. 
the first thing that I noticed before anything else was it. Standing in the nearest window, roughly four feet away from me, was a gaunt creature. At first, I thought it was an old man, but it didn't take long before I realized that it wasn't. Its skin was gray and wrinkled like the bark of an old tree. Its eyes were sunken like dark pits that had no end. I couldn't see the eyes themselves, but I could feel their icy gaze violate me as it scanned its unholy sight upon me. For the brief moment that I was the only one awake, this creature and I shared a tormenting few seconds of silence and fear. I was paralyzed, but I could tell that this thing was delighted, that I was petrified. It seemed to feed off my fear like some kind of grotesque parasite, latching itself to the most vulnerable part of my soul. I thought this would be the most horrific thing I'd ever have to encounter in my life, but I was wrong. The hideous creature that was only separated by a thin paned window began to do something horrifying. The silence was broken by the familiar singing of that eerie tune from earlier. This creature was now singing it loudly, while also trying to do what I could only assume to be dancing. The creature moved rigidly, like its body was stiff from decay. Its dancing almost felt like a taunt, like it had me right where it wanted me, and there was nothing I could do to escape the inevitable doom that was sure to come. The singing caused me to break the trance of fear and allowed me to finally scream to alert everyone else. All the scouts slowly woke from their blissful dreams that granted them ignorance to the horrors that laid outside. It didn't take them long to see what I was screaming at, and they also followed in screams of terror. Mr. Dawson was a heavy sleeper. Even with the screams of the scouts and the creatures singing quite loudly, he lay tucked away in the other room. Two of the scouts were brave enough to open the door to the other room and wake the old scoutmaster, to hopefully rid us of this terror. Once awake, the scoutmaster knew almost instantly what was going on. He hopped out of bed while only wearing his evening apparel, which consisted of some socks, old faded boxers, and a white t-shirt. He grabbed his pistol and made his way for the door. Our screams then turned to shouts and pleads to stay inside, but the old man was determined to do what he wanted. He unlocked the door and before he opened it all the way, the creature stopped singing and rushed the door with an unnatural bolt of speed and fury that I'd never seen before. The door flung open, hitting poor Mr. Dawson right in the face, causing him to fall violently. The fall probably did more damage than the door, as he let out a loud huff of pain when he landed. His face streamed blood quite quickly, which soon began to run onto his t-shirt. Despite the door hitting him and having the wind knocked out of him, Mr. Dawson was able to sit upright and aim his pistol at the creature, whose figure now stood in the doorway. His aim, despite the blood obscuring his sight, was rather on the mark, as the gunshots briefly illuminated the cabin with flashes of orange light coming from the pistol. Chunks of the creature blew off, but the bullets didn't seem to phase the creature. The creature's quick burst of speed quickly closed the gap between itself and Mr. Dawson. The next thing we all knew, the creature's nails gripped into his head much like someone were to palm a basketball and lifted him off the ground. Mr. Dawson let out screams of pain as the creature then lifted the screaming scoutmaster, and then began slamming him down head first into the wooden floor. Mr. Dawson sustained two powerful hits before his screams were silenced. The creature continued until the floor began to break under the high force of slams. Once lifeless, the creature then dragged Mr. Dawson out of the cabin and off into the woods. All of the scouts were either screaming or crying. Our only leader who was responsible for keeping us safe had been viciously slammed into a pulp effortlessly, all right before our eyes. One of the older scouts jumped up and slammed the door shut while locking it. All the other scouts began to place furniture around the door to provide a barricade to our only line of defense of that creature. The hour was late in the night, but there was no chance that any of us were going to find sleep after this gruesome event that just unfolded in front of our innocent minds. It took the troop around a good 30 minutes before we began to calm down. 
It didn't dawn on us right then, but we eventually realized that our way back to town was a five mile hike in the very forest in which this creature lived. If we were to ever make it back out of here, we would eventually have to take the chance and hike back. An hour later, just when we thought things were going to be calm, we heard the same chilling tune off in the distance. Much like before, the creature was also dancing, except this time it began to twirl something. It had two items in each of its hands. The closer the creature got, the better we were able to see that the creature was twirling the arms of the scout leader that had been ripped off his body. The scouts began to scream again as the creature danced around the cabin. The creature wasn't trying to get inside the cabin. It was just taunting us again. The creature eventually threw the arms at the cabin, making a loud thud, and danced its way back into the woods. The sun eventually made its way back into our lives, as we spent the longest night of our lives waiting for the creature to come back to eat us. Once the sun came out, the creature had yet to make an appearance. The scouts began to theorize about the creature. Maybe it doesn't like light. Why does it sing that song? Is that a demon of some kind? These were the ideas that we all shared with one another. We finally came to the conclusion that the creature was a demon of some kind, from a dark place and that it didn't like light. That's why we hadn't seen it since the sun came up. We finally came up with a plan to get out of here. We were going to split up into two groups and hike back. If the creature were to get one group, then the other would have a chance to get away. As we were getting our plans all figured out, we saw someone come out of the wood line. With the events of last night, we had all forgotten about Mr. Carlson coming up today. Mr. Carlson came walking towards the cabin while carrying all his stuff when another figure appeared behind him. Mr. Carlson was about 30 yards away from the cabin and was in the middle of us and the other figure in the woods. We all began to scream for him to run to us as we tried unblocking the door for all the furniture was still there. To our surprise, the figure behind Mr. Carlson was Mr. Dawson. For a brief moment, we were all very confused to what we were seeing. Did Mr. Dawson survive the attack from the creature? Mr. Carlson stopped as he turned around to see Mr. Dawson standing in the wood line. Our shouts must have been muffled by the cabin as he seemed to ignore us and walk over to Mr. Dawson. Once we were able to get the cabin door unblocked, we were finally able to yell at Mr. Carlson to tell him to run to us. In response, Mr. Dawson began to dance and sing much like the creature we encountered earlier. This wasn't Mr. Dawson. It was the creature imitating him. We all left the cabin and sprinted to Mr. Carlson to pull him inside, but the creature began to transform back into that hideous form. Mr. Carlson watched in horror as Mr. Dawson transformed into the most terrifying beast he had ever seen. Like before, the creature grabbed the head of Mr. Carlson and dragged him off into the woods, as Mr. Carlson screamed for his life. Some of us took the opportunity to run back into the trail and hopefully make it back while others ran back to the cabin. My fear overtook my body as my mind instinctively ran on the trail leading back into town. The five miles went by quickly as my adrenaline carried me most of the way back. Once I reached the base of the trail, my adrenaline had been flushed from my body, as well as the handful of scouts that had followed me, and we collapsed in front of a family that was unloading a minivan for a hike. We were somehow able to find the strength to scream at them that our scout leaders were dead and that they should call the police. The police came and rounded up the scouts that made it back and questioned us about where the cabin was. We gave them the correct information and made their way off into the woods, while the paramedics took us to the hospital. The remaining scouts that stayed back in the cabin were found inside. All of them had been killed. The door had been broken down and their bodies thrown about. They had no leads on who or what had did this, and they ended up closing that part of the trail that led to the cabin. I haven't been back in those woods since. Not just those woods, but any woods in general. My warning goes out to those of you who might find themselves in the woods this time of year. If you hear crying, just turn back. Nothing good will happen if you investigate.